talk about how the test is going to be given after we finish the last set of new slides for Roman art. Uh, and also, you know, the most effective way to study, and then you won't need to worry about uh, certain slides. We're going to cut that list of slides down by at least a third, the list from the syllabus that uh, you might be tested on. And of course, it's a, an open book test by definition, because obviously you can look at your notes and then you'll have 48 hours after the exam is given live online to go back and look at it on YouTube, just like all the other lectures. And so you've got almost every opportunity there is, as long as you, you know, have decent notes. Uh, or if you didn't get from one of the meetings, you know, they're all on YouTube by 7 p.m. on Friday. So this lecture will be posted by then. Um, and then what's the name of the YouTube like, uh, link? Channel? Oh, yeah, it's Mark Wilson's uh, SRJC Art History Lectures. Here, let me let in this other person here. Yeah. Mark Wilson's SRJC, four letters. Um, another person wants in. Um, art history lecture. And then you just look up the lecture you want, which class you're in. And of course, it's our 1.1, which week. And you'll see them. There's a little icon too that week, but, but just look by the week. Oh, that's interesting. A sideways glance at dog ears. <laughs> that looks like a. a a nice, uh, <laughs> let's see if we got anybody else that needs to be, the, there'll be more people joining us there were last night all the way up through after the break. Okay, um, <laughs> that's interesting. I didn't know you could do the sideways thing. I guess it, could, it either comes across that way or <laughs> you can rotate it. <laughs> that's good. A nice collection of things on your, your prints there, it looks like, or Trotsky's is what my grandmother would call those things from different places on your wall there. All I have is a poster of Chicago from the 1933 World's Fair. Uh, actually, it isn't even from that. It's from that decade that my uh, wife got me for Christmas about 10 years ago. Okay, so let's get to the, the main topics now that uh, in the order which the, the importance is. So I'm going to go ahead and mention this. Um, we, I'm going to see if I can get the gallery view so more people can. Yeah, there it is. Join us. And then I'll do the speaker view in a little bit. Okay, the um, the main thing I want to mention, I've sent an email about this. It, this is the most highest number percentage-wise of any of my classes in several years that haven't sent the papers in on time. I'm not trying to shame you or anything like that. I'm just saying things back up. It, it, we are getting almost in the midterm, and there are people who haven't, wait a minute, is that yeah, sorry, let me get these people in. The format has changed, by the way, and I have activated the chat function. So you have that option. Yeah, okay, thank you. There we go. One of your fellow students just posted the um, the, the way to look up my lecture uh, for any of the classes you miss or just want to review. You'll probably want to do that to review, but let's get to the review and the test after the break. That'll be our second half tonight. Okay, before that, I've gotten 26 papers out of a class of 43. So you can do the math. Ooh. That's like almost not quite half, 40% that haven't. You have the option, of course, of turning papers in late without uh, getting them marked down a, a higher amount every week. But don't let that lull you into the false sense of security that I can wait till the last week of class and do both my papers. It never has worked out for students of mine in the uh, classes I've been teaching at 24 years now at the JC or any other college when people wait till the last couple of weeks to do either let alone both their papers they didn't almost never get a good grade in the class because then they they're backed up with the this class with the final and of course all the other classes they've got so so do yourself a favor and try to get them in if you get them in I sent you an email but some of you might not have seen it uh, it was yesterday saying if you can get the papers in by midnight tonight they'll only be five points off for being less than a week late uh, I'm giving you that slight extension. They should have been in by the time of this class. And then after that, they'd be 10 points off. So it won't go up, in other words, from five points to 10. And then it doesn't go up again until after midnight. So if you need more time, go ahead and take the time. You can make up 10 points with extra credit. But don't forget, extra credit is something you don't want to wait to the last minute either. Because there's uh, 50 points that could help anyone get a whole letter grade higher than their actual 
point totals uh, if you utilize the uh, that a aspect of the class or that opportunity to Is the there math. a way to know if uh, you received our email just to make sure that it's yeah. Get know about my paper. Yeah, let's do it this way. I think this is, I'm going to be proactive. I don't usually do it, but since it's such a large number, I'm going to read off the names of the people I got the papers from. Because if I did it the other way, some people might be squirming in their seats or otherwise think I was picking on them. So here are the papers I've gotten as of five. Now, if you sent me something after five today, I didn't see it. Actually, more like 445 because I had a lot to do. So here we go as of let's say 4.30, because it takes a few minutes, you know, for emails to arrive in inboxes. Okay, uh, from all the papers I have from Art 1.1, this class, McKenna Welch, Joanna Persley Griffin, Michael Pitkovich, Gavin Lockhart, I'll say them slowly, Alejandro Castillo, Jimmy Maza, James Kraus, Riley Beerbaum, Jessica Wells, Regan O'Rourke, Jonathan Kangson, Gloria Jimenez, Mark Durham, Emma, and then it looks like Kapalayani, that's a Hawaiian word, isn't it? Hughes, Claire Shoup, uh, and I still got a few more, Annabelle Stulpe, uh, S-T-U-E-L-P, Jared Franklin, Franklin, sorry, Colton Miller, Diana Perez, uh, let's see, uh, Sabaharal Harmanpreet, and I wasn't sure which was the first and which was the last name, but I have it correct in the roster, so um, I hope that person is hearing their name. Jessica Rosales, just a couple more, Nathan Gaston, Julie Martinez, Alandro Gonzalez, Alex Aragon, and Wayne Susuta. Those are the people I got papers from so far. So if you didn't hear your name, either if you know you sent it in after 4.30 or 5 today, uh, I'll be, because I read those names off, I'm not going to then contact all those people again by email. But if someone wants to make sure if you hadn't already sent your paper in and or, you know, send it after 4.30 today, then send me an email. But to remind me, but I'll probably just be proactive and say, okay, now I got your paper. It's only X points off or whatever. Now, if you were sick, you know the rule. It's not mine. It's the district rule. All I need is something in writing. That's the requirement the college has. Anything to verify you were ill or had a family emergency, some written evidence, you know, a, a screenshot, a, you know, a PDF of, I don't know, a hospital admission thing or a doctor's, you know, visit, whatever it is. That gives you an extra week if you were sick during the week the paper was due before points are taken off. And that's been the rule since I put that out the first night of class. It's in your course uh, grading policy handout too. Okay, now is a good time to ask uh, if anyone, well, if you sent me your paper after 4.30, you probably don't need to tell, I can't go look at it right now. And there really is enough time at the break. My mainframe is where I store all my files, uh, you know, the big files. And that's out in a separate building, not in my house. So I'm not going to go out there right now. I don't know what the weather's like there, but it's fixing the storm here in Berkeley. It's cold, wet, and rainy, or about to rain, I think. We need it, I know. So anyway, any questions, though, about late submissions of papers or relating to that topic? Okay. Um, yes. Yes. So um, I joined a little bit late. I'm sorry. But um, you said that if you didn't get it by 4 today that it's going to be 10 points off? Is no, that no, no, no. Right? Midnight. Midnight. midnight? I'm giving okay. you an extension. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense because I gave everyone else till midnight the day it was due before they were counted late. And you know what? I saw a few people submit at 12, 16 a.m. I didn't take points off. But if they submitted at like 5.30 in the afternoon, the day after it was due, yes, there were five points off. You can inquire that anytime. Like, did I you know, any paper, any assignment, you know, midterm or, or the second paper or, or extra credit. Did you get it if you want to? And then also, I don't have time to go to respond to every single one, but I will respond as soon as I see your emails. I check my email, I think it's six days a week. I, I take one day a week off to be with my family. Mm -hmm. So pretty much you should get back from me within 24 hours. If you have a question about whether I received anything, an assignment, uh, a late paper, uh, extra credit, Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? 
Uh, okay, let's do this. Just as a reminder, because some of you weren't in the lectures, maybe even missed the beginning at least of some of the others. So I'm going to go to full screen speaker view here now so you can see. Whoops. <laughs> Now it's not wanting to do that. <laughs> Hang on, uh, Mr. Wilson. I do have something to say. Here, go I ahead. sent my paper. I sent my paper paper to you on the twenty third, just on the day before it was originally due, and oh. you didn't read my name. Did you not receive it? Okay. Hang on. Give me your last name because sometimes names don't match what's on the roster. That's part of peacock, the like the bird. Uh, I don't think I got it. If you sent it to you know. I'm going to, well, it'll be easy to verify because there will be some kind of a timestamp thing, right, on the originals. Just resend it, and I'll confirm with you tomorrow, I promise, if you'll send it okay. to tomorrow before noon, okay? Thank you. I won't count it late, assuming that I, you wouldn't make that up. Plus, I'll be able to see when you first send it. But don't forget, some people are not sending to my AOL. They're sending to uh, the um, uh, Outlook account. And not in this class, though. I don't know what it is. This class seems to be more focused on that uh, point, even though it, this is the larger of the two classes I'm teaching this semester. Uh, but the point is that, that that could cause problems because it's hard to explain. It's just such a cumbersome website to deal with. And I don't look at those papers as, as soon as the others. Plus, it's harder to send them forward if I need to to a reader because I can't grade all the papers all of myself. I do nothing else but grade papers. And all the hours I'm not here and awake, I'd be just, you know, so, so obviously I need to have a consistent system and that's my mark, W at AOL. Believe me, it's much less with the filter I have on. It doesn't filter out anybody. It hasn't yet, but I always double check the spam folder, but uh, I doubt that's what happened. So just resend it, okay? And you'll get credit and not be late and I'll confirm it with you. Okay. Thank you. All right, sure. Uh, now I'm trying to figure out, let's see, speaker view. That should be, I uh, think, me now. Yay. Okay. The reason I'm doing this is just to give us, uh, give you guys one more heads up. If you haven't turned your paper in yet among the 17 or one out, it sounds like it's 16, because there's one person I didn't see the paper from that just spoke up. So 16 papers I assume I'll be seeing soon, or at least I hope it will. If you didn't already know this, I'm holding it up one last time. This is the format that you should use for your first paper in that you need to label your file correctly or it also could get mixed up, not, not just, it's important for two, two things, well, three things. First, it has to be a PDF. I cannot open a lot of the other files and that's this college or district's requirement for all students' assignments and, and uh, documents that teachers send to the students. So that's a given. Uh, people send me some other kind of attachment. I may or may not be able to open it and uh, that, that will, would make your paper be late if I can't open it. So please make sure, or later than it would otherwise be. So please make sure you send us a PDF with the cover sheet at, to markw at aol.com and then just like this. And then if you wanna take a screenshot, if you haven't already, you should go ahead and do that. I'm about to put this down, paper down now. All right, 1.2 short paper number one, make sure you label that way. And then underline last name, comma, first name. And one last thing on names. I get all kinds of people submitting things, more so in the other class. How dumb were they? Oh, someone wants to be admitted. Hang on. Welcome. We're just finishing up about getting late papers if you haven't already. Uh, I have gotten people sending me either through someone else's email with a totally different name as a handle. And I, who's this for you? That's the person not in my class, you know, it's, or you might have a different last name because life happens and people, you know, do that. I understand that. But please try to stick to sending the files with the exact name you were registered under. Whatever you, surely you have a record of that, right? When you enroll, whether it was online or in person for this class, because that causes all kinds of confusion. It can take a whole bunch of time to look up who is this, you know, what, I have to figure out which, you know, a person with the same first name, because there are a lot of people with the same first name, of course, in a class with 45 students uh, or any any such uh, class in a college, you know, so, so please make sure you be very, very specific to list just the first and last name the way it is on your registration form, then it should show up easily on my roster. Okay. All right. Now, anybody notice the news from Italy, from Pompeii? 
this week, extra credit option alert, five points if you forward to me any kind of, uh, you have to actually send me a whole article though, not just a link, because uh, that's, that's lazy. Uh, but actually read it, I hope. A recent find, anybody know what this what I'm talking about? Of a, an intact ceremonial chariot in front of a stables in which all the horses' skeletons were preserved inside after Vesuvius. Of course, you know what happened to Pompeii, right? Yeah, I'd actually seen that article. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. It's very ornate and fancy. The thing was used for wedding ceremonies, you know, for well-to-do, probably you know, upper middle class or wealthy couples, uh, for the bride to be taken to the ceremony in this fancy chariot, and it was found under the portico, parked like, you know, an Uber car waiting. For <laughs> and, uh, the Romans. This is my take on it, and you're going to see that with my own slides. Here's what we'll do. We'll do the last, I think it's only four, three or four more must-knows. Three of them are from the uh, file, the files at the college that are on, you know, the same uh, file that I've been showing you. But then we're going to back out of it. It takes me like 90 seconds sometimes about that uh, and go to my own slides because the final must-know is on my own personal slides because I wrote a thesis about Ara Pakis. You'll see why it was worth, people have written whole books on it. It depicts the first four Roman emperors and their families parading through Rome in a procession to celebrate Augustus season. Remember who he was, the first Roman emperor, 20th anniversary. He still had 25 more years to go as the first emperor. So we're gonna talk about that in a little more detail than some of the other slides. And the rest of me in my set of slides in my own trip to Rome, or she's from two trips, you don't have to take notes, but I'll we'll keep an eye on the time. And then we'll take a break. And the last part we'll talk, it'll be all about the test. So don't disappear because we're cutting the, down the list for all of you that you won't even have to worry about thinking uh, about or studying by a third at least uh, from the syllabus, the must know list of slides, as well as about that many, at least 25 or 30 percent, maybe more, from the terms, list of terms to know. And then I'll show you how the test looks, we'll, we'll, and you'll be able to ask, ask any question you have, and I'll stick around as long as that takes. But for those of you who, you know, get the idea you need to know, what you need to know, you might be able to sign off early, probably around 920. That's how it worked out last night. Okay, I was saying the Romans, I didn't finish the thought, sorry, are more like of all the ancient cultures that you could ever study or that we have covered in this class, they were closer to being parallel to what uh, modern, what do you want to say, post-industrial uh, developed, quote unquote, there are different terms that you could choose whichever one you think is appropriate, first world, uh, you know, wealthy, Western, whatever, they're not all Western countries by any means, but, but you know, modern, um, nations with uh, a high degree of uh, infrastructure, we'll say, like, you know, the U.S. The Romans came closer to matching what we have. They had, this is what surprises me, five-story apartment buildings with elevators, not electric, of course, but they had elevators. I'll explain that as we go through some of the slides I'll be showing you on my own. They also had supermarkets with uh, shopping carts, People push shopping carts through the aisles of supermarkets and they had special sales. And I don't know if they called them out because they didn't have electronic microphones, but they had megaphones. Uh, it's an amazing thing. I mean, gladiator combat's a little extreme, but we do have boxing. It's kind of a blood sport, isn't it? I mean, uh, among other things, right? Uh, and of course, they really were, of course, advanced technologically, way above whatever other ancient cultures had been before them. And then they collapsed, <laughs> but 500 years, they were the dominant culture on earth. It, it, not everywhere, but the most advanced culture. And so we're gonna end up with that. So let's go to the screen share. Now let's hope this works because yay. Yeah, there we go. This is the first must know for tonight. I passed by or passed over it, I should say last week because I wanted to get back to it. Um, and I'm gonna move this out of the way. Okay, it's on the syllabus. So it's uh, actually from uh, week seven. So it is tonight's uh, topic, one of tonight's topics. Okay, here we go, Villa. Livia, that's L-I-V-I-A, wall fresco, and the location is Rome. 
and the date is 10 BC or BCE. You don't have to remember the little C, though, that just means we don't know the exact year. Okay, uh, so why are we looking at a particular fresco when there are thousands of them? Just in Pompeii alone, there have been thousands, or well, hundreds anyway, that have been restored. This one was restored, but not recreated. That's an important distinction. So let's start with saying that this is a fresco on the wall of the wife of Emperor Augustus, his second wife. We talked about her last week, but if you didn't, if you missed the lecture or you, you didn't take the, the notes about her, you should now. She was not just his wife. She was a kind of a partner in, in his you know, decision-making. And some say she really had arranged, in other words, ordered the murder or mysterious death of his two biological sons who should have been his successor. Either one, of course, the older and then the younger. They both disappeared, uh, died in, in, in uh, suspicious circumstances. Uh, unexpected accidental deaths. So that left only her oldest son, Tiberius, uh, as his successor. So it's circumstantial, but we don't know. All we can say is those facts happen, whether she was the one responsible, no one can prove. I told you about I, Claudius, you don't have to write this, but if you weren't here last week, if you want to see a really well, well written, really well acted and beautifully filmed, authentic and accurate portrayal of the gory, bloody, uh, and of course, uh, somewhat <clears throat> Uh, ribald, we'll say, lifestyle of the royal families of the first Roman emperors and their intrigues uh, with each other behind, you know, the palace walls. You should watch that series I mentioned, I, Claudius. It's brilliant, and it won every award at the time it was on TV. <clears throat> it was a British series, but it played in um, PBS here in the U.S., and you'll see what I'm talking about. We're going to get to a few of those things when we finish up tonight. Okay, so Olivia, in other words, was more than just the wife of the first emperor. She was an advisor, a confidant, and he sought her, you know, input or advice on many decisions. She wasn't a co-ruler. You wouldn't want to go that far. No, he had the final word. But uh, nonetheless, she was a powerful woman. She had her own villa. So this is on the wall of her villa. She and her husband, Augustus, lived in their own separate villas. That was a common thing among the ruling classes in Rome. Uh, okay, so what we see about here, the other part of the meaning is look at how brilliantly accurate this portrayal is. The more you look at it, the more modern or closer to being modern this looks, like maybe a 19th century landscape before Impressionism, right? Look how realistic it is. The mountains surrounding Rome, which they do, are shown in the early morning, hazy, remember, blue, hazy look of atmospheric perspective. The Romans perfected, in fact, something they invented it. So this is an example of how the Romans, you can just say it this way, perfected the technique of atmospheric perspective, as well as all the other techniques for depicting space, except scientific perspective. Now we'll do the formal analysis at the end, but we'll get to that. But even if they didn't have, you know, the diagonal lines all meeting at a, they know they've x-rayed this, that we know what's underneath the paint. Uh, they didn't have a common vanishing point. Okay, so they didn't know scientific perspective. That didn't come up until the Renaissance. But they kind of look at this, where the tree is. Things line up accurately in this garden area where the walls here, right? That was a, that's a concrete wall. That's a, a wooden lattice wall. Again, how modern looking. I don't know about the rest of you, but I've seen walls of it. Certainly where I live in Berkeley, there are a lot of garden walls that look like either this lattice work wall, look how detailed that is. And of course, all the other techniques, we'll get to them in the formal analysis, are super realistic. You know, the texture, cement texture and modeling and all that. But it's the, the effect of realistic depiction of depth that is really the most remarkable. And the Romans, this is the, one of the other facts to mention uh, about this, the meaning of this. The Romans were the greatest fresco painters of the ancient world. No, nobody argues with that because they did perfect these techniques for realism, not just for, for depicting space or depth, but also for the most heightened details of simulated texture, modeling, color. They, their best artists were almost as good as and were, they were the old Roman, villas like this one was discovered hundreds of years ago and it sat in semi-ruin for years and now
ignoring it. Here, we got one more person, sorry. So the Roman frescoes, the best Roman frescoes served as an inspiration for the Renaissance, for many of the Renaissance painters. There's no question of that. So, okay, that's plenty on the meaning of this. Let's do the formal analysis. Well, you can see how balanced it is, right? This main fruit tree here in the middle, pretty sure it's a fig tree. Maybe the one she poisoned her husband with. There's another theory. We don't know, you have to write, well, you could if you want. He died of some kind of food poisoning and she brought him figs from her garden. And uh, some historians think she smeared poison on the fig. Sounds like Putin, doesn't he? <laughs> anyway, it's a, because he changed his, or threatened to change his will to take her son out of the line of succession and name someone else, I don't know, a general or somebody else, a, a cousin or somebody else in his family, which he could have done. I mean, he was the emperor. So when she heard that he was gonna change his will, he died shortly thereafter. So you decide if you think that sounds suspicious. And it was th th figs that th his, th this is all recorded, you know, the doctor's notes and things about, well, he suddenly got sick. So who knows, maybe these very figs caused his demise. I assume those are figs. Anyway, so we have fruit trees. You can see orange and uh, I've seen these. I've been to this part of Rome. It's on the outer edge of Rome on a hill overlooking a valley with the mountains in the distance, just like this. It looks the same today, except now there are <laughs> electric power lines and things in the background. Okay, so let's do the formal analysis. Just first, we already did the balance. And then we have the rhythm, of course, with the lattices on the fence and the fruits and um, leaves of the trees, the tops of the mountains. I think I already covered, well, I didn't completely do space techniques. Okay, obviously you've got the atmospheric perspective, look how well done it is. And then of course there is overlapping, of, of, there's foreshortening, right? And clearly diminishing size of the trees in the background. But there is one last thing to add on the formal elements about space. There is a freehand approximation of scientific perspective. That's very unusual. Uh, the Romans, some people think they actually invented it, but no one's ever found evidence to prove there was any single Roman fresco that had a vanishing point. That's part of the technique, you know, from the definition. By the way, I'm telling you up front, that definition could easily come up on the midterm, and I'll explain how when we do the review after the break. Uh, so you do want to remember, you know, when you have, you know, an artist draws diagonal lines onto the canvas, which all meet at a common vanishing point. Well, the vanishing point would be behind the tree here, wouldn't it? But there is none. We know that this has been examined multiple times, this fresco. But somehow the artist just add it that way, and then we'll do the rest of the formal analysis real quick and, and move on to the next must know. But you do want to mention, if this was on, I'm not saying it will be on the midterm, uh, and you had to analyze it, that um, this does have a visual approximation, you could say, of a scientific perspective in the way that the garden wall uh, and the plants line up with each other. But it isn't the actual technique. It's just some artist figured out the concept without knowing the exact technique. Okay, the colors almost all cool, aren't they? Except for the fruits and this uh, wooden lattice fence, right? And the modeling is strong and realistic as is the simulated texture on the fruits, right? And on the uh, fence, we mentioned that, that wooden lattice fence. Almost looks like a redwood fence in my neighbor's yard. Uh, and then we have the rhythm, of course, of the repeated shapes of the trees and the tops of the mountain. It is mostly stable, but it has a dynamic quality to it because of the tops of the mountains. But the trees are pretty much upright. However, their branches aren't. So you could just say it's both. The two fences, right, are obviously almost entirely stable, except for this one uh, jutting out portion. Okay, and the largest mass, well, that's hard to say. The mountains, if you count them as a single mass, would be. And then it's probably the two fences, they're about equal, and then this largest tree. Okay, um, so let's go on to the next one. Okay, we already covered that, but we didn't. This is not a must up, but I want you to see this so that you can rest your, your hands and don't need to take notes for a couple of minutes. This is a fresco from Pompeii, from the walls of a different villa and it shows Hercules as he uh, comes home after wandering for 20 years. His mother thought he was dead. That's his mother. And she's 
swooning or, or is he happy to see it? But see the intense emotions on their faces compared to a lot of the earlier frescoes. And this must be another relative who's just, you know, so happy and surprised to see him after all these years, well, 20 years. Uh, it's a long time in anyone's lifetime, obviously. So this is, a, it's, a, it's a, a myth, a scene from the myth of the life of Hercules. As you know, he was a superhuman, supposedly Greek warrior. And remember the Romans pretty much just copied or co-opted the, the Greek gods and Greek myths, just changed the names into Latin. So this is uh, Hercules returning home after wandering ar around the Mediterranean, you just say wandering for 20 years. Again, you don't have to write that. Uh, but you see the similar texture and how realistic it is on his muscles, his skin, his hair, the expressions on their faces. And then this wonderful color, you don't have to know about this for the exam, but this is called Pompeii Red. And it was imitated all over Europe. I mentioned that, and you should have it in your notes from last week when we talked about the uh, fresco of the Dionysian cult, right, in Pompeii. That was one of the must notes that's on the syllabus. Okay, uh, that color is unique. It hadn't been that particular shade of red. It's got other colors mixed into it became an inspiration for interior decorators. Yes, <laughs> really would be from the Royal British, you know, family all the way down to some of the early uh, colonial homes on the East Coast in the colonial uh, towns of- uh, The place where I work is painted that color. <laughs> oh, where where is that? In Petaluma, it's what the museum's painted as. Oh, you work at the, oh, the uh, historical museum downtown? The Petaluma Wildlife Museum. Oh, wow, I don't know about that one. Hmm, that sounds interesting. I'd have to take a look at that. I'm sure they have a website, right? I was going to give people a suggestion they could go there if it's open now, but I don't know if it is because Sonoma doesn't have, isn't in the red tier, right? Yeah, it's still closed, but it's hopefully going to be opening soon. Yeah, same. I sure hope so for all the museums. Yeah, I do know that De Young is and the Asian Art Museum, two museums that I love going to because even the permanent collection is worth seeing more than once and they'll have special exhibits. So just, you know, you know how to do it. You just Google those two museums. I think the Legion of Honor will be open soon, too but it wasn't listed. So it and the Museum of Modern Art, those are the four most interesting ones in San Francisco in terms of broadness of, and depth and size of their collections, of their permanent collections. But they, all the museums in San Francisco have, or in the Bay Area, have special exhibits. So keep an eye out. And that's worth 10 points extra credit when you show me evidence that you attended the museum. You don't have to write anything, just a ticket stub or some kind of, um, you know, a screenshot to verify that you uh, paid for the admission to a museum, any museum of art. Okay, let's move on to, we covered these last week. Remember I told you, if you weren't here, these two slides are super important. The Pantheon, that's this one. And of course the previous one was obviously the Colosseum. High possibility that one or the other will be, not both, on the um, midterm. Okay, we covered this. I think that's what we ended with, but not this. Okay, this is the next must know. And this one is equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius. And that's going to take some spelling. I'll go slowly and spell it out for you. Um, okay, equestrian, as some of you know, that means having to do with horses. Many of you, I'm sure, either ride horses or maybe own them. I've never been on a horse, but... I hear it's fun. E Q E S T R I A N, equestrian statue, you all know how to spell, of Marcus Aurelius. And that's M A R C U S, then A U R E L I U S, equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius, Rome, 175 AD. Well, there's a lot to say about this because let's start with the fact that this statue was misidentified when it was found during the Renaissance in Michelangelo's lifetime. So during the mid Renaissance, it was found, you know, 500 years ago, you can write it that way if you prefer. Uh, and it inspired many sculptors of the Renaissance, including Michelangelo in some of their most famous sculpture, because it was so lifelike. And they thought it was the Emperor Constantine, the first Christian emperor. We're going to talk about him after the midterm. By the way, on the night of the midterm, which is next Wednesday, don't disappear uh, during the break or after the break, because we're going to go right into early um, uh, Christian art and then 
that'll segue into Islamic art. And some of those slides could be on the final. Remember the final's not cumulative. So after you finish it, you don't have to worry about what you studied before the midterm. Okay, did I say the final? I meant, yeah, the final's not cumulative. Okay. All right, so who was this guy? Well, we say the name in the title and who was he? Marcus Aurelius was, you could say it this way, one of the most highly educated Roman emperors of all time or ever, you could just say ever, or in the history of the empire. He spoke several languages, at least six, I think it was maybe eight or so, several languages. He was a published author. Yes, they had publishing houses. Everything was hand printed and they had slave labor. So they might not have made 50,000 copies of something that was a bestseller, but they, they had book publishers. So he had been a philosopher, a teacher, I believe a professor at an academy a uh, philosophy professor, I think. So he had written articles, books, and taught in the subjects of you know, higher education, including history and philosophy. I, I forget what other subjects he, he taught and wrote. So that makes him what? An academic kind of, right? I mean, from an academic background. But he was then in line to be emperor. And when he became emperor, he became one of the most uh, enlightened. That's the right word to use. Now, emperors are still dictators, of course, but he stopped the persecution of the Christians for a while. I don't think during his entire reign, he lasted 20 years. Back then, that was longer than, way longer than most Roman emperors. Many of them didn't live even two or three years before they were assassinated. So he was popular. He, he had a stable reign of uh, 20 years. He was well-educated, and he was enlightened in that he did not you know, use excessive, oppressive, you could say oppression uh, or, or, you know, force against people who didn't have the same religion, Christians, Jews, and so forth. Not that none of them were ever, you know, punished or, or, or executed during his entire reign, but he personally didn't um, approve of that. So it turns out that even though we now know it wasn't Constantine, we're talking about what he was like after the midterm course, um, this guy was pretty enlightened. And he's also the one, you could write this if you want, if it's on, I'm not saying it will be, but if it's on the midterm, he's the emperor depicted in uh, Gladiator that Richard Harris played. Yes, that's the same Richard Harris that played Dumbledore, right, in the Harry Potter movies, that guy. And yes, his son, I don't think he looked like Joaquin Phoenix in that. That's a great movie if you want to see something about what it was like, you know, the intrigues in Roman families in a modern Hollywood movie. Uh, and, and of course, uh, there, there's a little license there. I, he wasn't murdered by his son, this emperor. He, he died sometime in his you know, late 60s or so, about the normal lifespan for upper class people back then. But he had ruled for 20 years. And after he ruled, yes, the corruption, the rot set in. His son was corrupt, the way that movie de depicts in many parts of it. But you could just say after him, his son and other later emperors became more and more corrupt. Uh, there were exceptions, of course. There were some that were less. But in other words, he, some people say, was the last, or one of, you say, one of the last really great Roman emperors. Okay, and he's riding his favorite horse, which he rode into battle whenever he, and he did have to, sometimes he did go to, in that movie they start, if you've ever seen The Gladiator, where he has to go to, Russell Crowe, of course. Is, is, was his father an emperor as well? Uh, that's a good question. I should know that answer, and I apologize. I should have looked that up. I wasn't thinking, of, I was checking the, 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 the websites for the thing about the chariot to make sure I had all those facts right, right before class. Um, I can't remember. Extra credit, extra credit if you want to check that out uh, at some point. I mean, actually send me an email with some information from an article. You remember, it's always worth five points at least for any one page or longer article relating to anything having to do with art. It doesn't have to be from the syllabus. So I don't know. I, I'm get he had to have been somehow connected to a royal family, I think, to be able to take over. He didn't have to. In other words, he didn't seize the throne. That's how some emperors took over is they killed their predecessor. He didn't do that. He died probably, probably just of old age, you know, who knows. I was just wondering um, if he wasn't corrupt because he wasn't born into the royal family. So could he, be, could be, uh, could be. Fought his way to that position. Well, well, at least absolutely to a certain extent, that's got to be partly true because he wasn't a political animal. You know what I mean? He wasn't spending his whole adult life and his professional life trying to get power 
because we just right so you got a good point i mean in essence he wasn't from that branch if he was from a royal family he wasn't from the grasping greedy power hungry branch of any royal family <coughs> and frankly he he used to say he thought about giving up in fact he was going to abdicate i think that's in that movie i haven't seen in years gladiator that he was thinking of abdicating before he died and giving the throne to someone he thought would be you know not corrupt um, but he died before that happened and so his son took over um can i uh, actually quick uh, psa it's actually okay. available on amazon prime for free okay, so if you have that account uh highly recommend watching it what you can which which one uh, uh gladiator yeah it's really good i love it yeah. love that movie yeah yeah i've watched it about three times when they, they first the slaves first walk up to come into the Colosseum, that captures the overwhelming power and might of the Roman Empire in one scene, like no other film I've seen uh, before. Okay, let's uh, do a formal analysis. This is balanced, um, and it is uh, uh, twice life size. So for space, it is do uh, twice, it was colossal. That's the right word, colossal. You don't have to worry how to spell this right how it sounds. Colossal scale. He is twice the normal. On others, if he's 30, he'd be 12 feet tall, and the horse would be twice life size. But there is the technique of overlapping, obviously. The real space, I just gave you. And then there is a technique. He overlaps the horse. He's what medium is it? Is that bronze? Uh, yes, it's bronze. Okay. You, you just anticipated my next point. It's bronze turned green with color. Let's go up close and see a little better. Uh, let me pull this down. Yeah, and so it started discoloring. It's been it's in front of Michelangelo designed the city hall. That's the city hall of Rome. And he still use it the way he designed it. Obviously, the man was a multiple, multiple talented genius, Michelangelo, because besides his famous paintings and sculpture, he was a great architect. And this building functions as well as it did 500 years ago or more now than, no, that's about right. He designed it in the early 1500s. And uh, he was one of the people who suggested putting the statue in the plaza in front of it uh, to remind people that there are good and bad leaders, <laughs> which we all know from uh, experience or life, right? Yeah, it's bronze and it turned green if you're curious why the color looks odd. And so they moved it indoors. It's in a museum now and a replica is sitting in this spot. So you have to go inside the museum to see the original, but it's intact. It was found buried for almost uh, 1500 years, right? Because it was found in the 1500s or 1400, anyway, for many centuries. Okay, so to finish up, uh, the, the texture is the real smooth texture of bronze and the simulated texture of, of course, the robes and his hair and his face uh, and the horse's body. And th that's all done with carved line, of course. There's no technique for modeling. It's just the shadows from the natural sunlight. The two, uh, this is the base. That's added later during the Renaissance. So there's really only, yeah, there's three masses. The horse is clearly the largest, then the emperor, Marcus Aurelius, and then the base. Uh, it is mostly stable. Look carefully. He's sitting upright. His arm is out at almost straight right angle. The horse's neck and even the horse's front uh, hoof here, or even both front legs, I should say, not hoof. <laughs> front legs are pretty straight. So it's more stable than it is dynamic, uh, which isn't typical of equestrian statues. It's sort of showing him as a stable, you know, symbolizing his stability he brought to his reign, to his rule over the empire and keeping the empire prosperous and, and mostly at peace. The battles that that, that movie shows, that those happen quite often on the borders, what they do of any large you know, political entity, and especially an empire. Because of course, there are people that are, you know, always trying to, you know, raid the borders of a neighboring kingdoms or empires. So he did occasionally have to go into battle, but he hated it. He didn't like it. And uh, he, he most of the time he preferred to stay, you know, in Rome and talk to other intellectuals. It's very unusual to have intellectual ruling the Roman Empire, but he was. Uh, and I think he still published books after he was emperor. I'm pretty sure that's right. I, I might have that wrong. Anyway, so what, oh, color. It would have been warm when it was new. That's an important point since you brought that up about the bronze. So now it's a modeled mixture. This is how it looks now. I've seen it in the museum. Uh, the green part looks cool, but that's a discoloration. So originally completely warm bronze. That'd be the safe way to say it. Uh, and then we have it's balanced. He's balanced, he's intact, so is the horse. 
all, all their arms and legs and everything, of course, are, you know, symmetrical. Okay, and am I forgetting anything? Carved line, mass, space, um, stable, dynamic. I think that, okay, now I got to do this. This shouldn't be too hard. Sometimes it gives me a little trouble with trying to get to the files. So we're going to do stop sticky notes. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I don't use that. So I'm going to stop the screen share. You're going to give me a couple minutes here and go to another file. And for that, I may have to, ah, there we go. I can get, there we go. There we go. It'll take about a minute to bring it up. These are going to be my own slides of Rome. And uh, they will include one more must know, so don't put your notes away. But for mo most of the time, you get to just relax and listen. Um, there we are. There we are. <clears throat> okay. Now, I do always have to ask. Uh oh, I didn't see the screen share option. Where is it? Uh, shoot. Um, I don't think you guys can see this, can you? Unfortunately, no. not yet. Yeah, okay. Okay, hang on, hang on. I think I know what to do. To get to, to a screen share, come on. Yeah, I hope this will do it. Yeah, this should do it. Now it says I'm sharing my screen. Okay, can you guys see it? Yep. Oh, good. This is the Roman Forum. Just, just uh, relax and you know hear, hear this little bit of a guided tour thing. I, I think I remember a couple of people saying they've been to Rome. Anybody here tonight has been to Rome? If you feel like adding comments or you know uh, points of uh, observations, okay. I guess not. I thought in your mini bios I read a couple of you had. All right. So here's what we have. We have the columns of many ruined temples. This was built by Augustus Caesar, and it's a temple to the god of war, the Roman god of war. Uh, and it's all that's left is the portico, right? The column porch in the front, because this area was abandoned, of course, for, you know, whoa, wow, well over 1500 years. The Roman Empire fell, well, not well over, ne yeah, nearly. The Roman Empire, you don't have to know any of this, fell in 476. Uh, and so that's almost 500 years after the common era, right? Or after Jesus' birth, uh, according to, you know, ancient calendars. So what we see is over seven centuries, more like eight centuries of buildings that were added to this, the center of government. That's what the forum is. It's the center of Roman government. You can see that's the Colosseum. We're going to go up close to it and, and go in inside it as we go along here. And I've already given the notes from that, so I'm not going to give you a lecture on it. You don't have to write that. But when you get to the Arapakis, I'll tell you, and you'll we'll need to take one last set of notes for tonight. Okay, so let's take a walk down the Via Forum Romanum. That's the ancient Latin name for the first road that linked all the roads. You've heard the phrase, some of you perhaps, all roads lead to Rome. Well, that was an absolute truth. Back in the ancient Roman Empire, you could start at any part of the most far flung part of the Roman Empire. Remember, they ruled everything from Persia, which is today Iran. Look how far away that is from Italy. And the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula, all the way into what's Russia, past the Black Sea. There are Roman ruins in, in the Ukraine and uh, Armenia and even southern Russia on the Black Sea. I've seen them. And then all the way up to Scotland. That's, that's a big empire. So you could take one of the Roman roads and keep going if you knew, you know, you had a good map and you keep your direction straight uh, or you had someone helping you, right? And you would end up, you might have to take a boat if you if you weren't. If you were in North Africa, though, no, you wouldn't. Actually, you could, you could go all the way. The only place you'd have to take a boat is across the Bosporus, you know, where Turkey is, because that's a little bit of a gap there. There you'd have to take a boat. But you know what? The Romans build a bridge. It was temporary, but they actually built a bridge and then it didn't last very long. It wasn't until the 1900s, 20th century, that the Turkish government built a permanent bridge linking two continents. We're going to see that. We're going to see Istanbul, by the way, which is another beautiful city. But Rome is its own special topic. So let's get uh, into the 
we'll go quickly more quickly now as you walk along here you can see it has this desolate kind of look when there aren't a lot of people around but usually it's more crowded than this uh, i've been to rome four times and, and i this is the first time i went and i got up super early because i didn't want to you know miss anything i wanted to have the whole day and it was cooler in the morning it's the middle of the summer when i was there so uh, that's why you don't see as many people as you would normally now this temple's intact we're going to talk about it it has to do with marcus aurelius but you won't have to take notes and there's the hill where casa olivia is that might even be casa olivia i think it's actually behind it because her house yeah her house is on the other side of this hill that's where the rulers lived the ruling class it's a hill above the forum so they could walk down to well you could say to work but to the you know senate or to you know whatever temple they need to go to or to a public gathering where they might speak <clears throat> so that was the you know the powerful and mighty would occupy the villas on that hill i couldn't resist i'm a cat lover <laughs> There are more cats in Rome than there are people, and there is a calendar. It's still, the last time I checked, it was still being published. Now, this is extra credit for any of you if you want to check. I'm so busy, I'll, I have too much on my mind, I'll forget. Il Gatti di Roma is, of course, Italian for the cats of Rome. Some brilliant photographer in the 70s, he just started when I took this picture. I was still a student myself, a college student when I was there, a summer between two classes. And when I saw how many cats there were, I thought, you know, I wonder, it would be a good idea to take pictures of them and sell them. Well, you know, someone already thought of that. There was different scenes of famous Roman landmarks, or this is part of the beginning of the Roman road system. That's why the, these cats are lying on these 2,500 years. See, that's how far back the oldest parts of Rome go. That's why they call it the Eternal City. So these stones are over 25 centuries old. And the cats don't care. <laughs> they're just wanting food from the tourists. And some of them are feral. Some of them are neighborhood cats that just, you know, know that good food is coming from the strange people getting off the large vehicles with wheels, buses, of course. Uh, so they, they'll come up to you. They're pretty people friendly. All right. So this is that temple we saw earlier. So now we'll pick up the pace a bit. That's the temple to built by Augustus while he was emperor. And with marble, he had a saying, marble columns. The temple before he tore down and replaced with a fancier version had had um, just, I don't know, porous stone of some kind, maybe sandstone for the columns. And he said, I found Rome is one of his many sayings uh, near the end of his, his life. When he took over, he meant, I found Rome a city of brick. You see how much brick there is, right? And I left her a city of marble, meaning he rebuilt, which he did hundreds under his you know, orders were those pillars discolored from like they looked dark were that was that just like water damage or charring oh yeah that's water damage yeah 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 that's water damage oh because they've been in the open air now for a little over two thousand years now this was another temple where the brick part is the older section probably 500 years or several hundred years older than the marble which was added during augustus's time so it, when he was emperor, Rome was already 700 years old. It was founded in the 700s, but it was a tiny, small. We covered this with under Etruscan rule. If you were in the lecture last week, if you haven't, you should watch it before the midterm. We start out with the Etruscans who ruled Italy before Rome did. And they even ruled the city of Rome when it was just a small, you know, well, not a village, but a small a town. And by the time it grew to be big enough to overthrow the Etruscans, uh, that was still 500 BC. See, so these temples are from, uh, the, the foundations of them are over 2,500 years old. This is where the Vestal Virgins lived, and it was kind of a sad honor that they caught. They were chosen by the emperor's family, usually his wife, but it could be the emperor himself, to keep 15 of them, to live here and keep the eternal flame burning. And they believed the Romans had a myth that if it went out, the city of Rome would fall. Well, they kept it burning for over five, six hundred, oh, seven hundred years, I guess. And then in the four, early 400s, well before the city actually, the empire, I mean, sorry, the empire collapsed, the city of Rome for the first time in the early 400s, you have to know this, but just point of reference, was invaded and, and uh, occupied by uh, vandals. You know, I don't mean what we mean the word today, but it comes from that. One of the barbarian tribes that fought the Romans, uh, probably from Germany. 
uh, and they invaded Italy and they got only the Rome and the fire burned out the night before that in a storm, a big windstorm and the city fell to, I think it's the next day. So maybe there's some truth to that legend. We have that tradition. It's called the eternal flame at the Arlington Cemetery in uh, Washington for the unknown soldier, right? And the uh, French do at the Arch of Triumph, of course, for the same purpose. Uh, there's a flame that burns, you know, 24 hours a day there. So this this was a marble prison, you could call it, because they weren't allowed to leave the grounds. I mean, it wasn't just the building. They had some space, maybe a few acres at most, but they weren't supposed to leave and they were supposed to never marry. That's why they were called the Vestal Virgins. They were given a lot of great, you know, clothes, food, jewelry, honors. They would, you know, go out on parade during religious holidays several times a year, but still it's a high price to pay to... Uh, be chosen for that honor, if you can call it an honor. <laughs> okay, here we go. This is Marcus Aurelius's temple that he ordered built to his deceased wife. He really loved her. They, they, it was the only marriage. It's typical among upper uh, class, uh, let alone ruling class Romans, and especially emperors, to marry multiple times, even before they became emperor and or afterwards. He didn't. He was married his whole adult life while she was alive until the last, I think, 10 years he lived as a widower. And so what we see here is a temple in honor of his wife. I forget her name, but uh, she was someone that he relied on again for advice, much like Augustus had with Livia, but there's no evidence that she ever harmed anybody in his family. So let's go up close to it. See, the church is from 1620. Some of you may know that's the year the pilgrims landed. <laughs> uh, so that's as old as almost entire American, you know, European quote unquote colonial heritage we have, 400 years old. Exactly, almost. But that's dwarfed in time or age by the temple in front, which is from uh, 160. I think she died only halfway through his reign. So for a long time, he'd come here and worship her spirit. They believed in an afterlife, by the way. That her name is there somewhere. And it's functioning, this, this uh, church behind it, as a Catholic church. That's one reason that the, the columns have survived, and they're in pretty good shape considering they've been just left out in the open air, you know, and the weather for uh, 14 centuries. Okay, let's see an image of her. There's the uh, road, uh, the Roman road in front of that temple. And here, oh, actually, this is the view of that, sorry. And this is the steps. Of course, you see, they had to use brick even in their fanciest temples. But now we get an image of her. Sorry, the next one. There she is. She became a goddess. I don't know if he asked the Senate to declare as a Senate in Rome, they believed had the power to declare, I think it was just the Senate, someone a god. Can you imagine if our Senate had that power? Oh my God. Anyway, <laughs> what you have here is, is a view of her. She was a dancer when he met her, but one of the was well-educated from a prominent family in Rome. And she and he lived a life of, you know, happy academics, not seeking higher office power, whatever you want to say, political advance, until he, that, that is something I, that would be interesting for, if any of you want extra credit, I might try to look it up. I probably will if I think of it, <clears throat> if I have the time before our midterm. Uh, but anyway, the point is that you don't need to know this, but they were a happily married couple even after he became emperor, but they enjoyed their life before that even more from what I've read about him. Uh, they weren't seeking the limelight. In other words, this is a half life size, um, what's the word, um, part of the cornice line. Yes, the cornice line is the line on top. I'll go back and show you. Some of you may be writing papers on architecture if you haven't already. I haven't seen too many. There, that's the cornice line. But the front part of it was much taller, you know, like this. It would have had thick blocks of stone with different kinds of lettering or figures like her. And you see that there, she's being, you know, it fell off the building, they just left it there. And we already saw the Arch of Titus. Remember, that's an important slide. We'll see, I might, but I probably won't cut it from the study list once we, after the break, we do the review. Uh, okay, so here's another arch. You don't have to write this. We're gonna to get to the Arapakis in about four or five more slides. This is an arch uh, that indicates the corrupt phase of the Roman Empire, the, the slow deterioration of their moral and uh, political institutions. 
uh, under emperors that were assassinating each other, the average life expectancy of a Roman emperor after they took the throne in the third century, that's the century after a, a Marcus Aurelius, the 200s, right, was three years. <laughs> And a lot of them didn't even last that long because they would plot against each other. And so there wasn't any kind of line of succession because it was just all brute force and uh, intrigue. So if you get up close to this, I think I have a closer view. And then, yeah, I do. You'll see that these are soldiers marching into battle, you'd think, right? Actually, some of it is, as most victory arches are, are but it's also a monument to the emperor it's named for severus septimus sorry septimus severus the word to be severe we all know that phrase don't be so severe it, most historians linguists think it comes from his name because he had an army of secret police and spies everywhere in the empire especially in rome constantly seeking out real or imagined some of them were paranoid fantasies like Stalin had, right, of course, uh, enemies and having them executed. He had, the estimate is 20,000 people executed in mass, some of them, you know, at hundreds at a time. He, were, he managed to survive for 20 years, partly because of his uh, brutality. So this is both a, a monument to one or two military victories, maybe out of the four, there are four panels, right, on two on each side of, of battles. But uh, it's also a monument to the cruelty of this particular emperor. And here's the Arch of Constantine. I'm going to skip over it because we're going to cover it in detail when we get uh, the first slide after the midterm. Like I said, don't disappear. We'll be in that slide. I'm not cutting from the final study list for the, the final exam. So let me just say it's the first Christian emperor who built this. It's right next to the Colosseum. And he's depicted here. I will go ahead and show you a close up. I think I have one. These are these are these are life size figures of Roman soldiers and, and angels. Yeah, there we go. This is, of course, we covered it, so you don't need to take notes. Um, if you haven't seen the lecture, you want to get those notes from the YouTube uh, video. <clears throat> okay, so here's some scaffolding, right? Everyone can see that. They're cleaning it, right? Is, that's obvious, right? Guess what? <laughs> There's a bus from Teaneck, New Jersey. Anybody from New Jersey, don't take offense. Okay, <laughs> I have a lot of friends from New Jersey. <laughs> I've been there. Uh, but, but it just seemed like a stereotypical situation for this group of uh, tourists American, of course, too, is getting out of a bus at the base, not in this photo, the bus is not there. This was after I took this photo. And two of them were looking up at the scaffolding. And one of them said to the other, Mabel, what's that scaffolding doing there? And the other one said, I don't know, Ethel, unless, oh, I think I know, that's what's been holding it up all these years. <laughs> I think you get the irony of that. Uh, no, it was just well built. That's why it's standing 2,000 years after it was built. This scaffolding is supported by the building. I mean, I, I almost said something. I forget it. It's not worth going in. So let's go inside this structure. We're going to go up close to the outer uh, edge of it, of the Coliseum, of course. And it is 160 feet tall. I covered all this in the last lecture, so you don't have to write this. And it can hold between 50 and 70. And I, I opt for the higher figure because when I stood inside, you're going to see the view from the inside. Uh, if you have standing room, you know, uh, elbow to shoulder, or there's another phrase I can't say. Anyway, when people are packed so close, you can feel each other's bodies. And they did that with the poor, you know, the cheap seats. They weren't seats, the cheap tickets. And of course, it was free, actually. So they, they crammed people in. It could easily have hold, held 70,000 people. So let's get up close to it and you'll see how it's four, I'm sorry, I meant three, three rows of arches of equal height with the columns in between. And this is all, uh, you know, uh, marble discolored from, of course, age and pot marked from, guess what, not just time and the weather, but World War II. Now, this is something most of you could never probably heard, but here's a true story. See these potholes? Some of them were not potholes, sorry, I meant to say holes, well, in the columns and the walls. The ones in the columns are mostly from an outer layer of smooth white marble, because this is not marble here, clearly, you know, some of the upper sections are. So this is probably granite. And so the marble cladding or exterior of much of the, the bottom sections of the, of the uh, Colosseum was, was taken away, ripped off, stolen by the popes. 
Various popes just use this as a quarry for other churches. That may or may not be common knowledge, but that was common during the Renaissance. But some of the other holes, like here in the walls, are from gunshots. What happened after the fall of Rome to the American and British armies, the liberation is what it was, people cheered, you know, American soldiers getting rid of Mussolini and, of course, the Nazi occupying uh, uh, the city, the Nazi army. About 200 SS soldiers hid out inside the Colosseum. And then they started shooting from the top of this building. And you could imagine what a view they would have into the streets, killing civilians. You know, this is the part where the actually whole outer wall was taken by the Pope of the uh, 16, Julius the sixth, right? Or second, sorry, Julius the second. The Pope that built the Sistine, there we go, Sistine Chapel, stole the entire third outer section of the wall to build the biggest church on earth. That tells you how massive this structure was. And you still have over two thirds of the walls or about that left. So to put the point, find a point on that, what happened with those, uh, we'll go back to that last view for just like 30 seconds or so. Uh, the American commander in Rome, after we liberated the city and of course then occupied it for a while to regroup, heard what was happening. Of course, he probably saw people being shot and he said, okay, we got, we got to get rid of them. We have two choices. We can bomb them out, which would have destroyed this building because we had the, the air power to do that. Or we can send in a company, you know, a couple hundred soldiers and fight it out hand to hand. And that's what they had to do. So a bunch of American soldiers died to prevent this building from being bombed. Now that's what's called a real dedication to art or art history. And that's a story you don't often hear. Okay, so let's go under the arches and there we go. Look at this. If when you ever get there, those of you, I guess no one has, but when you get to Rome, of course you want to see this. Just think for a second. There's 50, 60, 70,000 people. See, up here were um, bleachers. And then the standing room was just, you know, even above that, the nosebleed seats, they call them in the Oaken Coliseum. Everybody at the Oaken Coliseum, anybody? Okay, 50,000 people. I've seen it full. During back when Ken Seiko, Jose Canseco and Mark McGuire played in the World Series. I saw two World Series games there. My wife and I had season tickets the only time we ever did that. And luckily, they went to the World Series that year. And there were 50,000 people there, plus people on the on the grounds around the edges before the game, you know, press and, you know, all kinds of entertainers and all that stuff. So there might have been 55,000 people there. I definitely know what that size of crowd looks like. And, and yes, this is a bigger space than than that. So I believe 70,000 is accurate. In any case, these cheering mobs would, of course, been cheering on the death and the blood and gore they were watching in gladiatorial combat. Now, here's the floor. No, there is no floor now, but it would have been the floor where the gladiators were kept in cages until it was time for each group to go up to fight each other. Again, that's well shown in that movie, you know, well depicted and accurately so, uh, gladiator. Okay, uh, I think we're going to move pretty quickly from here to the our, Oh, yeah, I forgot the seats for the senators. They got the fancy marble seats. <laughs> and of course, that's hard, nonetheless. It may be a finer, you know, softer or smoother. I don't know, not softer, smoother stone than, than the regular granite seats were or wooden bleachers, but it's still hard. It's still hard to sit on. So they would have had to bring their own pillows and their slaves, of course, care for them. Okay, so we're going to go to the last must know as we go. We already covered this. I'm going to go past it. Last week, remember, it's on the syllabus, the uh, column of Trajan, but it's my own view of how it looks when you're at the street level. Okay, and there's that statue of Marcus Aurelius. So let's go now to the Arapakis. How are we doing on time here? Well, actually, we're not doing badly. So I do want to show you a couple of Roman bathhouses, and then we'll get to the Arapakis. These are, uh, there are three gigantic Roman bathhouses that are left over from different emperors in different centuries. The overall thing about Roman bathhouses, they were free to the public and they had three temperatures, the rich, the well-to-do, right? They were restricted who could get in there, the, you know, the wealthy, the nobles and their slaves, was, was uh, hot water, you know, and, and of course attendance and towels and all that. Uh, you bring your own towels if you're, you know, average citizen, you know, middle class, we'd say today. And the water was kind of, you know, lukewarm and you didn't have any attendance, maybe one or two, you know, 
And then the poor got the cold baths, but at least they had a place to come in and wash themselves and it was free. And that's provided by the government. At different times, Roman emperors would build uh, to these kinds of gigantic public places to, of course, you know, um, kind of not endear themselves, but ingratiate, there we go, ingratiate themselves to the populace. And, you know, it was better than not having anywhere to go wash up. In uh, most ancient cities, there was nowhere for the poor to go. This is the Circus Maximus, what's left of it. If you never saw the movie Ben-Hur, not that awful remake, oh, that was terrible. The original one with uh, Charles Heston from 59 is the best version, or maybe you know roughly what happened. The chariot races, they depicted in either a version of the movie or the novel, they, they're pretty accurate. They did try to destroy each other's chariots with all kinds of strange devices. Three, some people say 300, I don't quite buy it, but too easily, 200,000 at least, people could fit inside this long, um, uh, it's a rectangular, an, an oblong uh, uh, racetrack with a, a long rectangular, uh, you know, uh, seating area. And there was no question it was the largest single outdoor amphitheater in the entire, in the the whole world at that point and all that's left of it are some of the walls and a few columns of course the racetrack itself and any remnants of it are long gone now we're going to go see the arab pockets but i just wanted you to see where we were when we were uh, looking at the forum uh, for most of the last several slides um, these are renaissance era churches and then this is even earlier medieval church tower from a thousand years ago so when they say Rome is an eternal city, they mean it is one of the oldest continuously occupied cities on earth. There aren't many that have nearly 3,000 years of continuous human history and occupation, inhabitants, I should say. This is Augustus's tomb, we're not gonna go into it. Now get ready to take notes, it's the outside of it. Here we go. Okay, the last must know. <clears throat> All right, Ara Pakis. It's uh, just two words. And it's in last week, week six uh, list, uh, halfway down. A R A, second word, P A C I S, Ara Pakis. That means Arch of Peace. Location, Rome, of course, and the date is 9 BC or BCE. Well, why are we looking at this? Just a bunch of, you know, car figures on a piece of stone that you probably never heard of. Well, it is the most complete record of what the or original first four Roman emperors and their families. I'll say it again. It is the most complete record of the appearance of or how the first four Roman emperors and their families looked. Done from life. We don't have to guess. This is what these people really look like. It's an amazing, these are life-size figures above eye level. And it was found by Mussolini's uh, soldiers. They were digging a subway station under the city of Rome before World War II. And uh, when they found it, they knew what they had. And so it got as restored as it could be. A few pieces are missing, but most of it is intact. And it was then put in this uh, protective uh, glass shed. So it's uh, open to the public during certain hours to go look at. As I said, I wrote a uh, thesis about it in uh, at UC Berkeley history class. Okay, here we go. If it's on the exam, that's the view you'll have. Because there in this section, this is why I took this size and round size, are all these famous people that we've been talking about. Let's start out with, this is Augustus. He was already a man in his, let's see, um, let me do the math. He lived to be 80. So this is uh, 15, let's see, 50, he died in 15 AD, 10, 25. So 25 years before 80, that'd be 55. So we say that, that's a, you know, an old age in ancient Rome. Many people didn't live to 50. The upper classes usually lived to 60 or 70. So he was the oldest person in this parade. It's, it's, it's some say a parade, the right word is procession. So you can just say it depicts a procession on a, uh, the celebration of Augustus's 20th year as emperor. That's what it celebrates, okay? It is a life from life. These images were done at the time by artists who would have taken wax impressions of the faces of each of these people. So we don't have to guess what they look like. You know, sometimes on a coin, they might get accurate images of the face of an emperor, but we don't have to guess these are the accurate portrayals of each of these people. So here we have Augustus, and then we have Claudius. 
the the one that that series I Claudius, the BBC series I've been commending to you. Uh, he was the fourth emperor and a good one. In between him were two of the most corrupt emperors in the history of the Roman Empire. Here we have, most people think that this is Tiberius. There is some debate about which one is Tiberius. But his son is clearly going to be there, his successor, right? And that would make him, right, most likely, because this guy's younger, he was the older of two brothers, and he was a, a manic depressive, as far as we know, or at least depressive, a, meaning he had some kind of, you know, born genetic depression. And, and that unfortunately affected his, his style of, of ruling <laughs> over the empire. So most historians think it's, it's him because partly due to the expression. Oh, I forgot I had this. If you go this far back, you can see better here. Yeah, that's probably him. And then that would make, <clears throat> Most likely, yes, she would follow right behind her husband. There's Livia. So there we have Augustus, Claudius, the fourth emperor. He was Augustus's nephew. You should, if it's on exam, you'd want to mention these things on the meeting. Augustus's second wife. You can just say wife because at the time this was done, that's he didn't have two wives, right? <clears throat> okay, so she was the empress, sort of. Not really, they didn't have that title, but she was the second most powerful person in Rome. And then we have Tiberius. And then we have little baby Caligula. Now, does anybody know anything about him? If you don't, you might want to write some of this and then again, you might not, because it's not very pleasant. He was a monster. Call everyone. Yeah, yeah. There's uh -oh. the yeah, you don't have to call everyone. Huh? Some of you may know. I'll just summarize it this way. He was by far the most unstable, mentally unstable of any Roman emperor. He was clearly mentally ill and delusional, should never have been appointed emperor, but Tiberius knew he was hated. So he wanted to have someone after him who would be even more hated. So by comparison, I mean, it's weird, but that's clearly covered in that I, Claudius. Uh, what do uh, experts think he had specifically? Like what kind of mental illness? I don't know. Uh, probably, um, uh, let's see, my mind is going on me because I have a brother who's um, battled with a schizophrenia, something like that. Really? If not schizophrenia, then some intense version of manic depression. He had so many people murdered just for fun, but that, that doesn't surprise any of us. What he did do was impregnate his sister. I mean, his biological sister, not his half-sister, his stepsister. And when she was eight, about eight months pregnant, he disemboweled her and took the child out after she, of course, died painfully and killed it because he thought that child would become a greater emperor or god. He thought he was a god, see, so he could do this. That starts off his first de declaration to the Senate was, I am now a god. And you have to, you know, okay, yeah, people began to get the idea right off the bat that he was unstable. And he, got, and he actually went downhill from there. Somehow he lasted four years. And all this murderous, corrupt behavior and all this really sick things that he did to people in his own family. He, he tortured, not, not you know, himself, but he ordered uh, Claudius to be uh, tortured because Claudius bothered him because Claudius was, it's in a, not a minor detail, uh, I like to say differently abled. That's the phrase most people use now. He was, he had a club foot. He had a stutter that he didn't overcome to the degree that Biden has. It stayed with him his whole life, even all through his rule as emperor. And he had a hunchback. That's like three strikes against you. It was a joke when the Roman emperors, uh, sorry, soldiers, I'll be all right. The Roman soldiers who killed um, little Caligula. He was assassinated by his own bodyguards. They hated him that much to try and get Rome out of you know, his, his control. And then they, as a joke, they thought they would run the empire. They um, declared Claudius, and they even said C -c 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 Claudius. It was, it was well known. He was made fun of everywhere he went in public. But he became one of their best emperors. He, he reformed a lot of things. He built infrastructure for, for the masses, and he built a whole harbor for the city of Rome that it needed. Uh, and he cleaned up some of the corruption and had people, you know, well, the word fired. <laughs> he didn't execute them, but he had them, you know, exiled, let's say, from Rome if, they, if he found they were being corrupt. He, he was a very good emperor. So they had two good ones separated by two 
not so good ones. <laughs> Caligula being even worse than his uh, predecessor. So there you go. You see why this is considered such an important find. Formal analysis, and then we'll we'll take a break. It's totally Him being down. shown as a child, were the all these people alive at the same time when this was yeah. created? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because Augustus lived so long that toward the end of his life, he would see. Uh, um, yeah, they, we're talking about his successors who didn't like he lasted 45 years. OK. Uh, and then Tiberius, I think it was 10. And then uh, Caligula, four, maybe three. Now, Claudius made it a little longer. I think he, he, he made it to 14 or 15 years because he was a stable, competent, popular ruler who was not only sane, but talented enough to, you know, balance. And it was a balancing act. Oh, there were people trying to assassinate him too. Almost every Roman emperor had a target on their back from the day they took the throne. Um, <clears throat> but Augustus was always able to get a step ahead of those. And he had a few people, Augustus had a few people executed, but he wasn't delusional about it. They were actually plotting to kill him and he would have enough information soon enough to take uh, action against them. So he survived 45 years, but it, so that makes sense if you think about it. The, 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 now this, so I used to think that that was Caligula, but he would have been much younger. He would have been just a, you know, just above a toddler, maybe like a five-year-old. Uh, and he didn't live past his thirties, I don't think. When he became emperor, he was maybe late twenties or so. Anyway, so there we go. Formal analysis, and then we'll take a break. Just about the right amount of time to right, right, just before eight. Okay, so first of all, the rhythm. Wow, it's so powerful. Obviously, every human figure has repeated over all shapes of their togas. Of course, they're all wearing togas, heads hands, arms, legs. And then we have really great simulated texture done with carved line. This is marble, by the way, this one. And the marble is an off-white color. It may look a little bit oddly discolored here. I don't know if that's just the lighting from the computer screen. I think it is. But it is a kind of an off-white marble. And of course, it has modeling. You couldn't see the details if it wasn't, because this is a bas-relief. Remember, it raised figures off a flat background. Uh, and then we have, it's almost entirely stable. There's hardly anything dynamic except a detail here and there, you know, the tops of their heads, but they're all standing upright. See, they're in a slow moving procession that the public will cheer all the way through the main uh, boulevards of Rome, probably to the Colosseum. No, it wasn't built yet. So whatever amphitheater might have been the Circus Maximus that they might have uh, greeted, you know, all those performers. And of course, it was days to celebrate a big deal, like the 30th anniversary of a Roman. No other emperor made it. Well, actually, one did. One, one lasted that long. Constantine, he lasted 35 years, but uh, that's the only other one. So to make it to 30 years on the throne is a big deal. So the whole city of Rome turned out, and there were all kinds of festivals, and he would have attended several of them. But first, he would have walked in this procession which is what we see him doing. Okay, uh, let's see. F largest mass, I, it's almost impossible to say. They're almost equal. Maybe he was pretty tall. He's about six feet. So to me, he seems like just about the largest mass here. And then uh, one of his two adopted sons, the younger one here probably is the second largest. Or this woman, see, she's fairly tall. But they're almost the same. They're almost the same height. Uh, we're finishing up with, uh, there, did you get that? Okay. We're finishing up with the last must know, the Arapaki. So if you, you can, you can see it on YouTube after seven on Friday. Right? Okay. So let's wrap it up and take our break. Um, and then don't disappear. You do want to be here for the, uh, discussion of how to study for the final. <coughs> we still probably end early, I think. All right. Uh, let's see, what am I, um, carve line balance. Oh, for space, the only technique is overlapping. There's no other technique here. This is not a register line. Don't make that mistake because this is just the base of the scene. There's not two or three separate groups of figures that are further and further away. So don't think of it as register line. It's just overlapping of the figures. Is it an optical illusion or is Augustus's uh, left foot kind of sticking yes. out? No, it's not an optical illusion. It is. He's putting his best foot forward. <laughs> well, this guy's is too. I just, I looked at this thing for, you probably think I'm nuts. I don't care. I looked at it for a couple of hours because it goes, oh, there's several more scenes. And the inside, it's a U-shaped thing. And there's all these other scenes of different events inside. So if you ever get to Rome, most tourists never even heard of this. And it's right next to the forum. It's easy. Plus, it's air conditioned. <laughs> 
you know, in Rome in the summer, you'll appreciate that, believe me. So I recommend you you go here and spend whatever amount of time you feel you want to. It's just fascinating. When you know what you're looking at, it, there's some explanations, but they're not that detailed. And of course, you see the swastikas here. Everyone knows the swastika wasn't Hitler's invention, right? I think some people still don't know that. It goes back to all the ancient cultures. The Navajos used it. The Chinese used it. The early Indo-Aryans in the Indian subcontinent used it. The Greeks used it. The Romans used it. Yeah, it, it's just Hitler corrupted it, unfortunately. But that's what this pattern is, and they love that on many of their... That's a frieze, it's called, yeah. Uh, so this is the modern protective housing for it and this is the actual but look how well preserved it is they had in order to move it into the shed they had to cut it into sections but they didn't damage it at all yeah it was Mussolini's government that uh, restored it for re uh, re-erected it is a better word because they didn't have to recreate much okay what am I missing here let's see oh modeling is just the shadows from the natural sunlight of course uh, and then um, rhythm, I think we've got, oh, balance. Yeah, each scene is balanced and this is almost a complete, this is as far back as I could get because the glass wall was behind my back when I took this picture. It isn't much wider than this, but there's no difference. There's maybe one or two more figures on either side. So it was clearly balanced with Livia and Augustus being pretty much the middle of it. Okay, uh, so I think we've covered everything. Yeah, we have that on the Roman art uh, must know slides. Okay, any quick questions anybody has about uh, what we've just covered in terms of the slides from the syllabus or a really, you know, burning question that you have in your mind about any of the comments I made that you don't even need to take notes on about the Roman sites that I just showed you. Because of course you can, you know, look up all this stuff on your own if you want for a paper later on or even the first one if you didn't do it. Okay, any questions? Because I think we should just take our break and it's almost eight, so let's say 8.15. All right, everybody, we'll see you then. Can't watch this or wants to watch it again. Can do so after 7 p.m. on Friday. We're gonna talk about the exam. Yeah, Nero came after Claudius. Yeah, and he was really awful too. Yeah, he was almost as crazy as, as Caligula. Anyway, the Roman emperors are a colorful, certainly, topic. But now, who was the one that put his horse in the Senate? That was uh, Caligula. Oh. <laughs> that his horse was a god, as was he, the horse less of a god or lesser god than him. Plus, he brought back a, a chest full of seashells and said it was gold and, and precious you know, minerals that Neptune, the god of the sea, had given him for winning a victory in a battle with the ocean. <laughs> These things are all in that series. I yeah, call. he declared war on Poseidon, and then they like mm -hmm. shot a few arrows into it, and then he's like, victory, collect the seashells. Yeah, he was definitely a little out there. Anyway, if like you said, you, there are a lot. Of, of course, there's that series Rome, but I don't think it goes up as far as Caligula. I can't remember now. It's pretty well done. That was a TV series in the early aughts, I think. Yeah. In any case, the best I've ever seen is still, even though it's now pushing 40 years ago, well, not quite 35, 1976, 78, somewhere like that. Uh, it, it holds up, believe me. I, Claudius. Uh, and it should be on, I think somebody said in this class, right? It's on Netflix or? Amazon. Anyway, you should be able to find it pretty easily. Uh, okay, we are now going to talk about how to um, study for the exam. But the first thing we're going to do is give you guys a uh, really helpful uh, bit of um, information. Here we go about the study list. After all, the syllabus is the study list, right? I've been saying any of these slides that we cover each week could be on the midterm, but I've also told you that I would cut a certain percentage. Well, let's now everyone please take your syllabus and go back to the first page. And if you see what I said here, that where it says note, the instructor reserves the right to cut and flow down at the end of that paragraph, I said, I will cut at least 40%. That's more than I used to cut. I used to cut like 25, 30, maybe a third percentage. 40% uh, is a significant amount that I will 
now we, I should say, together are going to do it as a group exercise. I'm going to cross out at least 40% of these slides. Now, the only way to do that is to I mean, vary the list slightly each semester. So I'm going to, you want to count with me? You can silently or otherwise. Uh, how many total slides are there? And that's how you find out how many is 40%, of course, and that's the number, uh, minimum number I will cut. Then what we'll do is go, I'll go with you week by week through the lists, week one, two, three, and, and tell you which ones from each week to cut. And at the end, just in case someone joins us late or isn't following closely, I'll repeat the list quickly one more time. Then we'll do the same, won't take anywhere near as long with the terms. And then I'll show you what the test looks like physically and how to study for it. All of which should take at most an hour, maybe less, depending on how many questions you have. But questions at any point, of course, are welcome. But let's do this count, total count now, okay? You can do it with me if you want. Okay. I come up with fifty one which is a bit of an odd number. Well, it is an odd number, obviously. Um, so I round up whenever anything is not clean cut numerically. So obviously 40%, well, it's not obvious, but I can do this. Some of you can in your head or if you have your calculator out with you, if you want to. 40% uh, of uh, 50 would be 20, but we have 51. So let's cut at least 22. That's more than 40%. That's more than I almost ever cut. Um, so here we go. Take your pen, please, and follow me with your own syllabus, copy of your own syllabus uh, in front of you and cross out the ones as we go along. Okay, uh, three from week one, because these three are all from periods we don't cover. Should be obvious, but if it isn't, that means the second, third, and fourth slides from week one, and here they are. Please cross them out now as we go through the process here. Libyan Sybil, okay. Wheat field with cypress trees by Van Gogh and the Guggenheim Museum by Wright. Okay. Moving on to week two. The Watchtower at Jericho, cross that off, and Bison from France. Okay. Moving on to week three. Head of a ruler from Nineveh, the third one down in week three. Um, Ishtar gate from Babylon. And at the moment, I think I'll leave, <clears throat> I'll leave those, but we may, we may need to go back and cut one or two more from earlier weeks. When we get to the end, we count up how many, if it's not 22 at least, then uh, I'll add some. Okay, moving on from week three, week four. It's, this is a hard one, yeah. Um, I guess I'm going to cut the pylon of Ramses II at a moon and the throne of Tutankhamun because there's two about him. But the other one, very high possibility, the funerary mask of Tutankhamun of being on the exam. But so is the Great Pyramids and the Great Sphinx. Remember that week we had, I think it was four that I said I won't be cutting. So that's just two, pylon of Ram's second, thrown a two dot common from week four. Okay, week five. Um, hmm, let's see. Kuros from Athens. And I don't think we covered the, the, or I cut it already, the temple of Athena Nike. Okay. Oh, young warrior from Athens. Um, let's see. Hmm. Going to decide if I should cut one of the two bases. Well, let's let's leave it for now. Um, so that's what one, two, three. The Kuros from Athens, young warrior, also Athens and Temple of Athena Nike from Athens. Okay, now moving on to week six. Porta Augusta from Perugia. Cityscape from Boscorial. Okay, and then moving down to week seven. 
I'm going to go ahead. I know we just did them, but well, the House of the Dionysian Cult fresco and a Villa Livia fresco, because they're very similar. Okay, I doubt that that's 22, but let's see how many it is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 12. Yeah, we've got to cut six more. Um, but that's not a surprise. It usually works out that way. Okay, so we've cut about as many as I'm going to cut from the first two. So let's go to week three. All right, everybody follow me here. Week three. I'm going to cut two of the dying lions. And I'm going to give you guys a break. Because Asher Nazar Paul, even though you have the syllabus when you're taking the test in front of you, right, and your notes, it is a mouthful. Uh, the dying lion, this is simpler and easier to uh, to write about. So cross off Asher Nazar Paul killing lions. Okay, so that'll be 17 under week three. Okay, week four. Boy, I don't know if there's anything here. I'll tell you what, I'm going to cut the Temple of Hatshepsut, and the only reason for that is because it's not a very good slide. It doesn't show the whole structure. Okay, week four, Temple of Hatshepsut. So that brings it to... 18. And then we're going to cut, um, let's make it the Lioness Gate at Mycenae. Okay, so that's 19. Um, hmm, Snake Goddess, Bull Jumping Frisco, Palace Complex. Okay. I know this is unusual, but I'll go ahead and cut both of the Nike slides only because it, you know, it's an odd view of her and it's uh, doesn't have, she's missing her head and some people must have noticed that it's not a complete image of a, of a goddess. So the last one, Nike Winged Victory, because it's also a double title, so that's more to remember. So now we're up to, should be 20. Okay. Um, Oh, equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius. I have to, I've lost track, so let's recount. We may have to cut at least one more. Okay. <clears throat> That's 21, which actually... Anybody have a calculator? I forgot to put my calculator next to my computer. I meant to do that. I think that I think that that is because yeah, actually, I, I'm slightly off when I said 22. Which ones did you cut from uh, week six and seven? Okay, I'll, re I'll repeat the whole list, but I'll do that real quick for now. Porta Augusta from Perugia and Cityscape from Boscorial. Okay. Uh, and then uh, week seven, uh, the last three, Equestrian Statue of Marcus Aurelius, Villa Livia, Wall Fresco from Rome, and the House of the Dionysian Cult. Yeah, I th that's actually slightly more than, than 40%. If you do the calculation, 20 was too few. 21 is at least 40%, maybe 41%. That leaves you with 30, because it's 51 total, minus 21. That's not that many slides. I know it sounds like a lot, but don't forget, you can look. You guys have this big advantage over any in-person class I ever taught, which is uh, it's an open book test. And I'm going to now tell you one stress reliever for all of you. I said this at the beginning, but some people joined later, maybe weren't focused. Uh, the test is going to be given in real time. You really ought to try and take it in real time. But then that doesn't mean if you don't feel comfortable with how well you did or you missed something or you weren't clear about something, you can go back as late as Saturday, because from uh, Thursday till Saturday, that's 48 hours, you'll see the test posted on YouTube. Then I will delete it, because I'm not going to leave it up there forever. We didn't cover the only one remaining for week seven. Let's see. The column. The column of Tujan, yeah, we did. We did that last week. Oh, okay, sorry, my we bad, did. I was we gone. Did. Yeah, we did. Well, no, it's, it's a good point to bring up any questions. That's what we're here for. 
Okay, so my point is that you're going to have so much time to go back and double check your answers. But if you're confident, just go ahead and submit it, you know, anytime after we sign off that night, which is a week from tonight, the test, you'll get an email reminding you of all this, of course. Okay. Um, Sorry, could you repeat it? Uh, like I'm going to repeat the whole list. Let's, I think do, that I missed some. let's do the whole. Yeah. So you all have the exact, it's 21 slides, redu reducing the total leftover to 30 which is about the most I've ever cut. So hopefully that, that's uh, good news for all of you. Okay, week one, we're cutting three. The Libyan Sybil, I need to say the artists, right? Wheat field with cypress trees and the Guggenheim Museum, okay? So we're only leaving Leacon in a sense. Week two, we're cutting two. The bison from France and the watchtower at Jericho, okay? Uh, week three, we're cutting uh, three. Head of a ruler from Nineveh, Asher Nazar Paul killing lions and the Ishtar gate from Babylon. Okay, week four, we're cutting three more. Temple of Hatshepsut, pylon of Ramses II at Amun, and the throne of Tutankhamun. Okay, week five, we're cutting five. <laughs> Lioness gate at Mycenae, the Kuros from Athens, young warrior from Athens, the temple of Athena Nike, and uh, Nike winged victory. We are gonna leave on the two most important ones. Remember, one of these two is very likely, uh, and that would be the Parthenon, especially because that is a temple dedicated to Athena. So we're not cutting, that would be doing uh, no justice to the Greek you know, uh, history of ancient Greek culture if we cut everything relating to Athena out. So you see, we've left in the main site, which is where her statue was the Parthenon. You, you can review these better than we ever could in a live class when I never could get through the whole list in one night to review. Now you got all these videos posted and you can watch them anytime between now and the exam, of course. Okay, moving on to um, week six, we're cutting uh, just two, Porta Augusta and Cityscape. And then week seven, we're cutting three, the last three, Equestrian Statue of Marcus Aurelius, Villa Livia Wall Fresco, and House of the Dionysian Cult Fresco. Okay, let's uh, move on to the list of terms to know, and I'll do something similar. Let's start by, I'm going to count. The, now, this I'm not going to promise to cut 40% because it's not that many. It's not like 50 terms, right? So um, I will cut at least, you know, five or six probably. And then what's left over, I'll explain as we do the actual. X description of the test and you'll see what it looks like. I have a copy of, of it here and I'm not gonna let you look at the uh, true false questions because you'd know the answers ahead of time, but you can easily look up when you have two days to do the actual test itself. But let's go over this together. Doing the same thing. We're crossing off things you don't need to study or won't appear as definitions in a separate section which is called the true false section and i will explain what that is in just a few minutes on on the midterm okay um let's see so we gotta get you know 2.1 yeah i had to list the terms from 1.1 hang on it's here everything is in my trusty real estate folder that i used to bring to all my real estate deals i made uh 200 some sales of real estate with this trusty leather book I was given as a present for being a top producer. Wow. And next year we got a pen filler for the pens they gave us. To you. I'm just kidding. Kidding. We had a rather cheap <laughs> corporate headquarters. <laughs> and I was working at a real estate office before I started teaching art history. Much more enjoy this job. <clears throat> okay. List of terms for art 1.2. All of you should have that in front of you. Let's go over it together. It won't take very long. I'm going to cross off I'm sorry, for 1.1. I had it right the first time. My mind slips a gear when it gets to be this late. As my daughter and I have discussed, yeah, I had it right the first time. Sorry. 1.1. Yeah. So the Roman, um, yeah, you know why? Because the first couple of terms are the same. That's what was getting me. All right. It is this list in case it's not obvious, right, that you should have been filling in as we go every week. All right, let's start with cherub. Cross that off. Okay. Um, 
amulet. Again, not something you hate, right? The fourth term down. I'll repeat these before we move on to discuss the test itself. Okay. Um, Got to cut it more than three or four. Okay. Move, move to the second page. Uh, the list of terms is important, but there's no definitions unless it's separate. Like, okay, you see, for instance, uh, the list of things invented by ancient Egyptians. Let's cross off the word below it, obelisk, because I'm not going to ask you that as a standalone definition or, or to, you know, apply it or use it or answer a question about it. But I might say something about things invented by ancient Egyptians included uh, frescoes, uh, obelisks, and aqueducts. True or false? You should already know the answer to that. <clears throat> If not, you'll see the evidence for that when we get to the, uh, <clears throat> the actual test. Um, of course, that would be false, obviously. All right, um, moving on. Let's see. Pediment, for sure. You can cross that off. And actually, even though the word portico is useful, it's not that important a uh, separate concept. So. Portico. Okay, see, we've already got to how many now is that? Five. And then moving on to page three, right, of the list of terms. Things are better with the Romans, definitely not cutting that. Um, we, we ended with triumphal arches. Aqueducts, I'm leaving on there. Um, triumphal arches. You know, I think I left one of them on. Yeah, okay. Uh, necropolis. Yeah, cut out Necropolis. That should be at least six. Let's see. How many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six. And how many were there? It should be at least a, about a quarter is what I was able to go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Six, seven, eight. Six, Yeah, it's more than a quarter, but you know what? I'm going to go cut one more. Funerary. Because even though, you know, there will be something likely from one of the, you know, works from ancient Egypt that has to do with funerals, you don't have to know the definition to explain the meaning. Okay, everybody turn back to page two. Cut one more. That's seven. That's as many as I, as I ever usually cut. You see below obelisk, right? Funerary. You can cross that off. All right, so I'll repeat that list and then we'll get to the uh, the other part of this discussion of the test itself. Okay, so on page one of the listed terms to know, you're cutting two, cherub and amulet. On page three, you're cutting four, obelisk, funerary, portico, and pediment. And then on page three, you're cutting necropolis. Okay, so you'll see how this works uh, will will uh, appear or how it will be uh, an item these these definitions how they could appear on the test you are going to have to regurgitate them verbatim i'm not going to ask you to do that that's what some of the art history professors at uc berkeley used to do to us and they gave us a hundred or sometimes more 150 slides to study uh 30 is a reasonable number and again it's an open book test okay so now here we go. The midterm, here it literally is in front of you, and I'm going to read the instructions, but you're going to see them. They're going to be printed, and you're going to get the test sent to you as a PDF, sorry. Uh, the day of the test, I should send it by four or so. I mean, you should have a problem logging on uh, between four and 6.30. To where well, you're going to have to anyway, but I mean checking your email. I meant to say checking your email. Well, that's how you log on to the class, and you'll see the test, and you do need to print it out unless you want to do it online and you have that you know the apps that allow you to do that, because it'll be sent as a PDF, and of course you have then two choices before we get to the discussion of each section and then taking any questions. <clears throat> there will be two ways you can do the test. Uh, you can fill it out by hand. If you do it hand printed, 
please don't use cursive. Cursive is always harder to read than the people who use cursive think it is. <clears throat> the neatest cursive is still harder to read than most printing. And if you print, please print not only neatly, but in ink, because pencil is always lighter or fainter to the eye. And, you know, obviously that affects someone like me. But I'm not wearing my glasses because I'm close to my computer screen, but I don't want to have to go blind reading your test, you know, uh, answers. So please use uh, ink for all your answers. If you're doing it in a hand, hand printed, print as neatly as you can. And please don't use tiny little type. A few people I know have that type of, you know, hand printing. <clears throat> Try to at least make the lettering a lar little larger than, you know, <clears throat> half the size of a normal print, which would be 12 point typeface. So most of you don't have a problem with that or it's not an issue. So just print as neat as you can in ink. And if you do that, you can write right on here. <clears throat> the other choice for how to answer your questions is, of course, to use the, uh, I think it's called sign and edit or fill, I can't remember what it's called. It's it's a PDF option, right? That most, uh, especially if you download it, I guess it's Acrobat. I, I only started learning these terms recently because of one of my readers is doing that, all her grading of papers like yours and other classes that I've given her uh, on, online, uh, which is great. That's good. I, I print your papers out, the ones I grade, and then I hand fill in the cover sheet. And then I send you a summary of what you got on the paper. The test, you'll get the same thing. I mean, you'll get a clear indication if you missed something more than one or two. If you get an A, an A is an A. If you get anything below an A, I always explain you know, what you missed that got you whatever grade a B or C. Most people have no trouble getting an A or a B on these two tests, the midterm and the final, because of the fact that it is open book, of course, and that you have those two days to go back and check your answers if you choose to. All right, so how is the test going to be uh, given? There's three sections. Okay, hang on just a second. First is slide identification. Each of the first five slides you see posted on my Zoom midterm session. This is in real time. Uh, I'm going to start the test at 6.45. That gives you guys, I know some people are just getting home from work. I'm totally aware of that and signing in late, later than 6.30, 6.35. But you do want to be signed in by about 6.40 or so just to be sure that you, you are able to see all the slides and ready. You have your, uh, your test sheet next to you if you're physically filling it out or whatever device you're using if you're doing it electronically or digitally. And uh, of course, whatever other things, pens, what have you. Okay, once again, in the first five slides, all you're doing is identifying them the way they were on the syllabus. Each of those first five slides will be posted for two minutes. That's way longer than most you're gonna need. Some of you will be looking at the ceiling, you know, and getting up and getting a <laughs> cup of water, but that gives people plenty of time because some people need longer than others. What you write, is, and I'll show you again if you want to take a screenshot, but you're going to get this entire document, like I said, sent to you, each one of you, as I always have to do, as a, a PDF so you can peruse it for a couple of hours before the test. The title, the way it was on the syllabus, spelled correctly, the artist or location, and the date, I give you a break. You can round any date that's that's specific to a zero, if that's easier for you because the last digit, in other words, can just be a zero. For instance, um, let's see, let's take a date like, um, um, yeah, Pont du Gard, Nîmes, France. You could just round it to 10 BC. Uh, or uh, the Arch of Titus, 81 AD. You could just round it to 80. If that's easier for you, you can round the date to a zero. But everything else has to be the same. If for you to get full credit, on each of these slide identifications, the way it was on the syllabus, okay? All right, so please spell each fact as it was spelled on the syllabus. Please create a new, uh, if you wanna create a new Word doc for this exam, you can, but I've decided hand printed works fine. In fact, some ways it's, it's, it's easier, easier for me to grade, uh, but it depends on how big your writing is and of course how long each answer is. So you decide that's up to you. Like I just said, you can do it either way, you know, on a, uh, you know, a 
a doc of some kind of doc, you can make a Word doc out of it, or you could edit the PDF of the, of the test if you have that ability on your computers. Okay, and then when you finish this section, you will have answered, it's five slides, I'll hold it up again, that you are identifying. That's all you're doing, you're not describing them on the first section, it's just pure identification. And that takes, well, you can do the math, two for each 10 minutes. So in the first 10 minutes, each one of these answers, each fact, each title, each location or artist, and each date is worth um, three points. So you guys can do the math, but I'm doing it now for you. That means if you get any each one of these correct, the title, the location, and the date, you get nine points for that answering all of the facts about that slide. And there are five of the slide applications. So again, that's pretty simple math, nine times five. In other words, 45 points is nearly half of the total of this test is in the first two minutes, or sorry, 10, ten minutes, because each slide is on screen for two. If you join us late, it's not the end of the world. It would be if you were in my in-person class because I can't go back because there are other classes coming in the class or right after mine. It was always a problem. So in a way, this is one advantage of our Zoom reality that we all are living in now that you guys can go back and see what you missed, you know, by watching the YouTube video <clears throat> if you need to. I don't go backwards during the actual live, only going forwards. Okay, so that's the first section the slide application worth 45 points nearly half the total then we get true false and here's where i have to do a little subterfuge because i don't want to give away the uh actual questions <laughs> before you see them but of course you'll have plenty of time there are five true false questions on the section here i'll do it this way here we go do it this way page two the second section Answer true or false for each of these following questions. we worth two points for each correct answer for a total of 10 points. And I'll leave this up for 10 minutes as well. I'm hiding the actual questions. I've already made the test up and it'll be coming to you, like I said, as a PDF attachment uh, the, you know, about three hours before the test or by 4 p.m. All right, that shouldn't take you very long, but some of you need the full whatever 10 minutes. Then the last section is I think the most uh, challenging, such as they are, because you do still have to uh, have you know good notes to do a good job on this last one. Part three is a slide analysis here. I'll hold it up again so that it shows that. Slide analysis is where you write short essays. And when I say short, I, I do mean short. Two paragraphs. So let me read the instructions and then explain them, and then I'll take any questions you have. Okay, first you would identify each of the following three slides, just like you did with the first five, on the top line with the same as it was on the slide, the title, the artist, the location, and the date rounded to a zero. Okay, um, that's the top line. Each of those facts is only worth one point here though, because the majority of the credit is for analyzing them, like you just did with your papers. So then you write two paragraphs about each slide or for each short, slide short essay. One paragraph should be the formal analysis and all you have to give me is six of the elements. I will say this to you, when the slides first on the screen for the very first slide essay, I'll remind you, but it's sitting, it's right here in front of you, it will be, you know, in, <laughs> in your line of vision while you're starting to write your first essay. You need to keep the two paragraphs separate just like you did with your papers so that I and my readers can tell which one is your analysis of the formal elements, but I only require on the test uh, six out of the nine elements. You choose the six that you can see clearest or, or have the most uh, clear analysis. Uh, you can do more if you want. That's your choice. But don't forget, when you do write those six sentences, one for each of the six elements you choose to analyze, in the first, you don't have to do it in this order, but it's best to do the formal analysis first, I think, it's, you know, because you have to look at the slide carefully to do it. Uh, when you do that, for each of those sentences, you got to give me uh, two examples, if you want an A, if you want full credit, just like you uh, would on your, your papers, as you do, did most of you on your papers. Uh, and that, of course, tells me you not only know the terms, you can identify where they are, you know, where, what, where are the warm colors? where is at least one warm color and one cool color if it's a mixture. 
uh, or you know, uh, the semantic textures, what are they? Give me at least two examples. That's a rule of thumb throughout this semester. I said that the first night of class, right? Okay, uh, and then the second paragraph, all you have to give me is six sentences on the meaning, six or more facts from the notes that you've all been taking on each of the slides that appear. There will only be three of these. And each of those paragraphs, there's six sentences if you do it just exactly to the directions. If you get them all right, that's six points. And then if you get six in the formal elements and then six facts about the meaning, you can do the math. But again, I'll do it for you. That adds up to six and six is 12 plus three on the top line to identify. So in other words, and it says it right here, the total value for each correct answer of these short essays, if you did everything correctly, is 15 points. And that leads to a total of 45 points. So you have an equal value for slight analysis and some would say slight memorization, but you don't have to memorize these slides. This Zoom format, of course, allows you to look them up on the identification. So roughly half the total points are on identification and the other half are on analysis, which may or may not seem like uh, anything special, but believe me, I taught, I mean, I taught, I took about a dozen, no, it wasn't probably 10 art history classes at UC Berkeley, and they were all over the place. Some professors just wanted you to memorize, just memorize. I hated those classes. Nothing but memorize, and you could, it was an open book, of course. And these, these exams were like three hours. This is one to one and a quarter, depending on, you know, how, how long people take if there's questions. Let's hope there's not stormy weather. <laughs> if it does, we have to just you know wait till the <clears throat> you know internet connection becomes stable again. That that shouldn't happen. It's not supposed to be any more heavy rainstorms, <laughs> which we could use next week. I've looked at the long range weather forecast. So the point is that the whole thing will take most of you just an hour, and if you finish up by then, you can decide to submit it right away or wait and look it over before you submit it to double check your answers or add to them. And then you have this backup option of watching or seeing the, the actual real live real time exam on YouTube. Uh, but this time it'll be Thursday because I want them back by the weekend because I want to get started grading them and sending them to my readers. So you'll have 48 hours from Thursday evening until Saturday night. So in case you work Thursday and Friday and you couldn't attend the actual live lecture of the exam, you're not being disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged. You have all day Saturday and well into Saturday night. In fact, I'll just make it midnight Saturday. That gives you plenty of time to go back if you already took the test in real time or to do it you know, from the video if, if you couldn't attend the uh, lecture. I think it's about as fair a, a scenario as, as, as I've ever been able to come up with for all the years I've been teaching it here or at any other college. Okay, so then the, the total value, in case it's not obvious, I, I did actually say this is 100 points. And that way, you know, if you don't do well on a few of these, and I send you your grade for some reason, I mean, you know, you just didn't have good notes or something, or you uh, weren't focused that day, or you were in a hurry when you turned it in, that's could happen, you should take more time if you think you need it. You have that option, obviously, I just said that. Um, that you can make up from, even if you didn't get a B or an A, you can still get at least a B, if not an A in the class, even if you only got a, a C or even a D on, hopefully nobody does not go with, on the midterm because of all the extra credit, 50 points. Remember that no one yet has done more than 10 points extra credit in either of my classes. And I realize that's not on your mind, but once you start getting your total points from each of these assignments, at least the first two, the first paper grade, you should get back sometime within two weeks, should be all back from the readers and mine that you've sent me, the late ones probably also, uh, and the test grades, which are at least another week or two. So within say th three to four weeks from now, you'll know halfway through the, this class where you're headed, what your grades looks like, and then you decide if, uh oh, I'm not up to where I want to be, I better do extra credit. Don't wait till the last few days, because usually that's, like I said, at the beginning of tonight, waiting to do uh, one or even both of your papers really late, like at the last week or two, uh, just before finals, uh, and or waiting to do extra credit just before the final one, um, you know, you 
could have done it earlier, uh, you might not be able to get all the things done that you were going to and not get your maximum of 50 points. So if you think you need that, you can check with me anytime by email and I will tell you your exact total points at that point and how many more you need to get the grades you want. 360 points, 90% of 400, the maximum of actual graded assignments is an A. Okay, so you'll be able to figure that out, but I'll even tell you anytime, confidentially, of course, by email. Um, all right, I see. Okay, are you talking about the, I see the chat here. Um, hmm. I'm sorry, if there's something I can help with that question, I can't read the first part because what I see, unless I'm just not, maybe I just need to scroll here. <laughs> I haven't looked at the chat. I think we ultimately figured it out. <laughs> It looks like you guys are doing a good job of, of, of interfacing with each other. I'm so glad. I, it took me a while to get that chat thing up and running. I had to talk to the head of the tech services, and he was, of course, <laughs> extremely experienced. And he said, oh, you're not the only professor who's had, you know, something. When we switched, to, they switched to a new system, and you guys weren't, weren't disadvantaged. But my Tuesday night class, I had to cancel class. I couldn't sign on, and no one told me what was going on. They've switched the account access all JC, SRJC professors have to go through the SRJC account, not their own private email access uh, route. And for over one and a half semesters, that wasn't a problem. So I, no one told me that I was aware of. So I suddenly had no way to teach a class at the last minute on Tuesday because I was busy doing other things. So you guys didn't have to suffer through that. So now the chat is up and running. We can see that. Does anybody have any questions about anything I've covered about the test uh, or how to study for it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I guess, oh, by the way, if you, don't worry, no names. I would not never do that. That's against all the rules. But I know there's several students in each of my, or at least a few in each class that have special arrangements for extra time. And those people have the extra time built in with that two full days. However, if it's about a paper, I can give you, if you have sent me and I have the proof that you have that arrangement with the, the college, right? The abilities office, they call it, right? I like that name. Uh, you should already have sent me something so that then if you then email me and say, I need a few more days because I'm having trouble with, that gives those people another legitimate, you know, uh, option of having a few extra days on your papers, the two papers, but it doesn't even come up with the test because everyone has like, if it was just a one hour test in person, then I'd have to arrange for you to have, and I've done it in real in person classes, I just arrange a different room because the slide lecture hall is, you know, so if you've been to Annalee Hall during the daytime, especially one class after another, after another, I can't, I can't stay in the classroom after I'm done with my classes. So I would arrange a different room, but that isn't an issue here because you'll have that 48 hour window, which will come up, um, you know, as of Thursday, probably about 7 p.m. So you actually have more than 48 hours. I'll give you till midnight on Saturday, and then I'll start collecting them and grading them uh, Sunday, probably Sunday evening. Um, I have a quick question. Please, any questions? You might have mentioned it already, but so if we do print uh, print it out and write on it, do you, do you want us to take pictures of it or and then that's email really it to your AOL? Yeah, yeah, you should definitely need to send it to AOL, and that's on the instructions here. You'll see that. Um, but but yes, uh, screenshots will work, but if you can- I would guess it, wanting it as PDF format yeah, again. PDF, that's the main point. Yes, because otherwise there's times when either I or some of the readers or none of us can, can open certain files that are PDFs. It's too iffy. And, and then, then you've got lost time and I've got to spend more time getting back and forth between you and me to figure out what, you know, what the problem is and you got to reformat it and resend it. Then it gets put in another pile and doesn't get graded until after all the other exams are. Um, so uh, yes, please, if you'd want to do a screenshot, you can. But I noticed, this is a good question. Some people, when they sent me screenshots in a PDF file of their hand-printed answers, I don't know what they did. Somehow they got the borders 
the, the words, you know, or letters at least at the beginning and end of each line are cut off. That's a problem. I can't read your entire answer. So double check that the image is clear. But of course, every so often I'll get one where it's tiny little print and usually I can enlarge it enough to read, but my aging eyes, uh, please don't send me something that, you know, is compressed. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's rare. That's only happened two or three times in the last three semesters since spring, right? This is the third semester we've been doing distance learning. Anyway, the point is, yes, make sure it's a decent size, you know, as in full size, you know, and that yet at the same time, the margins aren't cut off if you do the screenshot option and then turn it into a PDF. Yes, that's the exact way to send it in. Okay, these are important questions. So any, any other questions about anything from what we covered tonight uh, or, you know, your papers, especially if those of, those of you whose names I did not read at the beginning, if you joined us late, I read the names of all the ones I have papers from. And it, I may have gotten a few between five and the start of class. And I will confirm that if I see them because those are ones I couldn't have known about. I signed off around about 4.45 today. So anything you sent after 4.30, you probably want to remind me to remind you, but I will. I will. Um, and, and also try to get your papers in before the midterm because you don't want that hanging over your head because then we segue to a new set of slides right after the midterm. Don't forget you do not disappear, please. The topics we're going to cover in the second half of next week's class, any one of those slides could appear on the final. And then your second paper is coming up after another three or four weeks. So you want to you want to not, you know, back yourself into a corner. Looks like there's something here in the chat it may be something valuable that i yeah okay thank you guys for giving each other some helpful feedback that's one nice feature of among a few others of this uh, system you know i'm curious does anybody know anything about who now nah, why would we know who actually designed zoom in china right we're talking about communist china not not taiwan right i assume i actually never read about it People were telling me when I first you know, signed on, oh, watch out, they're going to spy on you while you're, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> but that, that happens with some of our domestic high tech firms, doesn't it? Anyway, nobody knows who invented it. It's well. Zoom was actually developed yeah. uh, in San Jose. Oh, really? Then by Cisco. Chinese company. Unless I'm wrong, that's what I was told by both other professors before I ever even heard of it. I didn't know where it was from. Um, thank you. Is that Wayne? Is that you? Yeah. Well, okay. So, but what is the connection with China? Is it just the server is somehow connected or they bought it? Like TikTok, of course, has gone back and forth, hasn't it? About I think the servers run through there. Um, that's it then. Okay. Must be some connection because I know I read people were getting paranoid at the beginning. Of course, more about Zoom bombing, right? I hope none of you had that experience. My daughter did. Albany High School. Yeah, some racist idiot, probably more than one, but anyway, a handful perhaps, got into one of the accounts in one of her classes and started spewing all kinds of crap. So now they have much more uh, controlled access and uh, security, which also happened at the college. But in the spring, I wasn't using Zoom. I was just having people uh, write papers instead of finals. So they had four papers. That's the only way I could, because I didn't know how to do Zoom until I had the whole summer to get up to speed. Thank you for the information. That's interesting. All I can say is then that person deserves some kudos, I would say, because I think it's a user. For, if, if I can figure it out at my stage in my career, I think it's it's well designed for you know mass use. It's, it's user friendly, much more than most websites that I've tried to navigate when I didn't already have someone show me how to do it. Well, you guys have all been great. I mean, good comments, good questions. I hope you enjoyed my slides of Rome. You're going to see some more of that kind of thing, you know, Istanbul and uh, one or two other places after, after the break when we get to uh, you know uh, art and historic sites from after the common era. Uh, Islamic, especially Islamic art is one of my favorite subjects. But anyway, you now have plenty to do. You know, if you didn't get your paper done, if you could get in before the next test, that would be wise. And then, of course, I'll see you all a week from tonight. The first slide will hit the screen at 6.45. So don't, you know, sign on at 6.44. You should try to be logged in 
long yet, I meant to say, by 6.35 or 6.40. And uh, I will explain one last thing. I almost forgot. It's not a long thing, but I'll have an announcement, uh, knock on wood. The editor of the Santa Rosa Press Democrat, I've worked with him for years. He's been the same guy. He's been there as editor for years. He did say they're going to publish my next piece, and it's longer than usual. And it's very relevant because any of you went to the public schools in Sonoma County, that's what the focus is about the controversies over naming or renaming schools and which schools are named after which historic figures and which of those figures should or shouldn't have such an honor. I think you all heard about Dr. Seuss's books. I have to admit, I was disgusted to see some of those images from some of his early that's books. That's pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and it's not surprising considering like the time period he's from exactly. that was very common i know my I, I don't mind admitting this i had two very different sets of grandparents i wrote about this in my i hope a few of you will read someday for extra credit before the final exam south side story you can see the reviews there's about 40 50 of them now anyway the point is it's based on real experience and, and my grandparents one was set was from indiana and the other from ohio that's where my parents were born i was born in chicago south side obama's neighborhood right and that's what i focused the story on south side story it's called okay and, and the two sets of grandparents couldn't be more diametrically different i had a grandmother on my mother's side who was the warmest, sweetest, loving person, never had any prejudice bone in her body, accepted as friends, people from all over, had them to her house. This is in Kokomo, a small town in Indiana, which was extremely racist. Back then, you'd see more Confederate flags in church parking lots on Sunday than you would American flags in some churches, not all, not her church. So, and then her husband, well, back in the 1920s, he goes, he went back that far. He was older than she was. He joined a certain group that I only want to mention has three letters, K. To be in three. I was so, I didn't know that until I was a teenager and long out of the, because they, they had died, by then, or, or he had, I'm sorry. The opposite, with my dad's family, my grandfather was a, uh, a ham salesman during the uh, Great Depression, and his best friend was the first black post and in his neighborhood in Columbus, Ohio. And he invited him to dinner and stuff. And, I, and then his wife, uh, I could hardly stand to be around her. <laughs> the N word would come out of her mouth so much that I would just they'd cringe. So yeah, yeah, the period you, you accurately described was sadly way too common and, and, and just, just accepted as normal. And I, I wasn't raised that way. My parents were not like that at all. They, they despised all kinds of racism. So yeah, it's, it's interesting, our society, the more we learn, the more we see things go in cycles. And so we're going through a different cycle. Can we backtrack a little bit? How is Dr. Seuss racist? What, what he it had about? depictions of oh, like, go ahead. Um, like the places you'll go and like those kinds of books, like the Chinamen with buck teeth. They're like African people that looked like monkeys, like that kind of stuff. Yeah, his <laughs> early books were written in the form. Yeah when it was just the norm. I mean, TV ads well into the, well, the early 60s began to change, began to change, but it took a while. Mm. And then by the late 60s, that wasn't acceptable. Was uh, it not published because it was too racy like no, that? No. Or was it published and then just forgotten about? No, no, these, yeah. that's a good It question. was forgotten about and they're now they're just about. not publishing anymore. Because later on, this is not uh, a balancing th factor, but it doesn't negate what the, but it's his own family that removed those six books from their list of 50 books he wrote. So the other 44 or so, they aren't that way. And he did do a mea culpa. I mean, George Wallace did that. Does anybody know who George Wallace was? <laughs> he about his most racist guy in this country. You know, the one that stood in the doorway in front of Robert Kennedy to prevent him from allowing the first black student at the University of Alabama. If you haven't seen the video of that, you should watch it. That's a moment our country reckoned with its legacy. And the right side won because he had to leave then, Robert Kennedy. But the next day, they came back with the National Guard after Kennedy, President Kennedy, nationalized them. And old George Wallace had to stand aside with bayonets, kind of say, you move or you're gonna get, yeah, to get just one African-American student into the University of Alabama. Later on, Wallace not only did a 180 on race issues, but went to the Ebenezer Baptist Church, you know, the one that Martin Luther King used to preach at, in a wheelchair, you know, he was paralyzed from the waist down by being shot, right? Attempted assassination, one of his rallies. He ran for president three times and got millions of votes. Sadly. Anyway, 
somehow that changed his perspective, maybe began to understand the suffering that he'd inflicted as a, as a racist segregationist. And he went to that church and he, he acted more, it's surprising, he could have just gone in there and got so emotional, it would have been embarrassing to the congregation. This is entirely African-American congregation. It's well documented. Jesse Jackson later commended him for this. And he asked for forgiveness, but first he acknowledged what he'd done that was harmful. And he specifically said what he'd learned and what he tried now to do to make amends. And the congregation as a group rose up and said, we forgive you. And he had, of course, he had tears in his eyes by the time he left in his wheelchair. Um, there's a good TV documentary about him called Wallace uh, with Gary Sinise. Uh, excellent. He did a, a really believable job of portraying this despicable man who finally learns a little bit late. It would have been nice if he'd learned sooner not to behave the way he did. Yeah. Well, people are capable of change. I guess I'm an optimistic. Uh, yeah, and, and Seuss did. In his, in his uh, defense, he, he later said that he was wrong and his own family withdrew those books. It's not a cancel culture thing. You know, that's a different type of issue that you get into big debates about. You know, all of that's not what happened. It was his own publishing company, his own descendants and family members made the decision to withdraw just the six books that had offensive images, which somehow still were, you know, now they're on Amazon. <laughs> Is it Amazon or eBay or something, you know, ridiculously expensive? Yeah, they're just not printing any new ones. Right, right. But the others, they are, because those don't have. And, you know, Obama invited uh, his widow to the White House. I think it was his widow, or maybe it was his daughter. She was probably dead by the time he was president. And uh, they, she, he and Michelle read from some of the later books, which do have an inclusive message. People can change, and, and we should encourage that, all of us have the capacity and of course sometimes need to recognize that we can change yeah to me it's it's part of the process that we're going through uh, my daughter's doing that right now well, you know she's got people online that she she'll get all passionate about but she'll back off and say okay but maybe you just didn't think of this perspective or you didn't know this fact or maybe i forgot this or i didn't acknowledge that you you know i like to give people the chance and we all i think do, most most of us do, uh, to recognize we're all flawed, <laughs> pretty much to some degree, and we can all learn from each other at some point, which is what we're doing now. Okay, uh, I see. Oh yes, he did. Yes, and some and some people say she. Now there's no proof of this that he may have gotten some of the or at least the ideas for some of his books uh, from her. But that, that wouldn't be surprising because they were married for years. Yes, that is true. So his personal life had, has its share of skeletons or flaws in it too. But his later books were much different and he definitely at least the ones after about 1960 weren't, weren't right. But the earlier one- My favorite was always the Butter Battle book. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Hop on Pop. I lived through that when we adopted my daughter from uh, Russia and the first time we got the you know wrestling around on the living room rug she had just heard that story read to her by me i think it was or maybe it was my wife the night before and she hadn't said more than two or three words she didn't speak a word not one word of russian or english in the orphanage in russia until we got her home and then the first word she spoke more how american <laughs> and then car then mama and then i came forth papa <laughs> and that's when she said the lines from that pop on pop thing. Yeah, anyway. So, you know, again, it's rare that, you know, any one person, work of art, a historical event is all 100% good or 100% bad. There are some that are, like the Third Reich, pretty much all bad. Uh, the KKK, pretty much nothing good about that. But, uh, but the, usually when you find there are people, you know, who learn from their mistakes, like, Apparently he did, as uh, Theodore Geist, and uh, certainly someone like Wallace. That surprised me when I read that about him going to that church and, and then also them accepting uh, his, his apologies and sincerity. They could tell. If it was phony, they would have known. Anyway, I think we've covered a lot of unusual topics, but it is part of education, right, to discuss how things relate to real life. I do miss the in-person part of it, but uh, this is the next best thing. So thank you guys all. Does anybody have any other questions? about anything other than what we just we kind of covered that for now at least 
the non, uh, you know, syllabus topics. But anything relating to the test, if you joined us late, you know, you can watch what you missed after 7 p.m. on Friday. Um, so next week after the exam, are we going to have more slides? Yeah, that's what I was saying. Early. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah on um, the quote, early Christian art. But really what it is, is Byzantine. And that's where you'll see slides of Istanbul. Well, we may not have time for them that night. We, uh, Istanbul, oh, it's an amazing city. You know, it's the only city that spans two continents. The only city in the world. Half of it's in Europe and the other half in Asia, and it's a 2000 year old city and uh, the Romans founded it, but it was the Muslim cultures that, of course, have built it up into this megalopolis. So when I went there with my wife, uh, it, it was already a city of 8 million, I think it's like 12 million now, and the people were so friendly. It was a great experience. So, yes, but mostly we're going to focus on what's on the syllabus. And yes, there will be notes you will need to take. Those could be on the final, anything after the midterm nothing before the midterm will be. The final is not cumulative. Okay, any other questions from anybody else? Well, I wanna thank you all. This was uh, an interesting and enlightening session, I hope uh, to some degree for, for all of you. And I hope he well, mostly helpful is what my intention was for you to know how to focus and not get too stressed out about the test, knowing that you have these backup options of extra time, and, you know, the videos and so forth. Thank you, everybody. Okay, is that it? Any other questions? One last time. All right, good night. Thanks, good Professor. Night. Thank you, guys. See you. Thank you very much. See you a week from tonight. Yeah, bye.